Namaste and a very warm welcome to all our participants from across the world on this almost now closing days of the Global Festival of Yoga celebrating wellness. Uh, we've had a great, uh, we've had like lots of wonderful speakers who have come on the show and shared their wisdom with us. Today we have another person from the Buddhist community who is here to speak with uh, to speak to us i'd like to request dr b allen wallace to please come on screen namaste and a hearty welcome to you we are extremely grateful that you accepted to come on this program and very very humbly uh, just within a short while we wrote to you after so many years and you got back to us so 
thank you very much for honoring us with your presence on this festival. So we had met, uh, Vinayaji and I had had the great privilege of meeting Dr. B. Allen Wallace at the International Workshop on East-West Approaches to the Nature of Mind, Consciousness and Self. And uh, we had a very engrossing discussion about uh, consciousness and especially about the importance of having more contemplative traditions uh, accompanied with scientific research on it. So today, our, today, Dr. Alan Wallace is going to speak to us on revitalizing in India's ancient contemplative science of the mind. A note on him, there's a lot to say about uh, Dr. Wallace, but just in the interest of time, I'd like to give you some of the main things that he has been doing so far. So Dr. Wallace began his studies of Tibetan Buddhism, language and culture in 1970 at the University of Gottingen, and then continued his studies over the next 14 years in India, Switzerland and the United States. During most of that time, he trained as a Tibetan Buddhist monk ordained by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, for whom he has intermittently served as interpreter since 1979. He was sharing that his association with His Holiness has been over now almost half a century, over half a century. So a very blessed soul indeed. After graduating Summa Cum Laude from Amherst College in 1987, where he studied physics and philosophy of science, he went on to earn his PhD in religious studies at Stanford University in 1995. He then taught for four years in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of California in Santa Barbara. He is the founder and president of the Santa Barbara Institute of Consciousness Studies and the director of a recently set up Center for Contemplative Research in Crestone, Colorado. He will be talking to us more about this uh, very innovative center at the end of his talk. He has edited, translated, authored, and contributed to more than 40 books on Tibetan Buddhism, medicine, language, and culture, and the interface between science and Buddhism, including Meditations of a Buddhist Skeptic, a Manifesto for the Mind Sciences and Contemplative Practice, Mind in the Balance, Meditation in Science, Buddhism and Christianity, and Hidden Dimensions, the Unification of Physics and Consciousness. Dr. Wallace is one of the most beloved senior Buddhist scholars that we have today. And uh, we have had a few speakers on Buddhist philosophy and practices with us. But today is a very special session because he's going to be talking to us about his personal experience also in this, in this upbringing with a contemplative tradition, what India can contribute in that field and what is the future for this dimension of work in the yogic traditions. So with this, a very warm welcome once again. We look forward to hearing your words of wisdom. And I request all our participants to please put their questions in the Q&A box. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. I'm just going to change my screen here just for a moment. Very good. <coughs> so namaste, everyone. It is my honor to join you on this very timely month or so of the celebration of yoga, the yoga festival, and the celebration of wellness. What more timely era in which to celebrate these themes when we are, of course, also vividly aware that we're in the midst of a pandemic which brings great suffering and challenges to the global population, as well as economic ones, as we all very well know. So one can say, well, why are we celebrating when this is such a time of great challenge, great difficulties? And well, this is especially the time to challenge, to, to celebrate the deeper sense of wellness that we can all cultivate. And so this is a time of the festival of the yoga. And as you, I think, all know yoga from huge, of coming together of union. In times of crisis, whether they're military, economic, health-wise, and so forth, these are especially the times when we all need to come together, East and West, old and young, different ethnic groups, and so forth, 
because we're all facing the same problems. Environmental problems that were here, they've been building up for at least 150 years. They were here long before this pandemic came up. The pandemic sooner or later will subside. Things arise and they pass, the nature of anitya, impermanence. But what is ongoing in the midst of this transient medical crisis is the way we are impacting our home, this planet, for all of humanity and all of the other fellow sentient beings with whom we share this planet. So it is a time for the yuj, for coming together, for union, but it's also a time to celebrate wellness. But then how can we do that when there is so much illness, not only of the pandemic, but so much illness? How can we celebrate that when we as human beings, all of us, old and young, whether we highly realized spiritually or really have no understanding of dharma, how can we celebrate wellness when we are as human beings in this cycle of birth and aging and sickness and then of course death and as many many great yogis around the world perhaps beginning with the indian yogis three even four thousand years ago developing samadhi and fathoming the very nature of mind and the subtler dimensions of mind that carry on from lifetime to lifetime, one of the most important discoveries ever made, the continuity of consciousness and the fact that we keep on coming back, coming back. And so we're celebrating wellness, but it's a deeper sense of wellness because there is illness, there is aging, there is suffering, there is death. And that's the nature of our existence here in samsara, in this, this mode of existence. And so this highlights an, enormous, an enormously important distinction between two types of happiness. One could say two types of wellness. And one in Sanskrit is called laukika, laukika, laukika sukha, mundane or worldly wellness, worldly happiness, worldly joy. And this entails good health and having enough to eat and food and clothing, clothing and shelter that all of our material needs are met and we can enjoy also the beauty of the world, the beauty of good music, of good food, of friendship, of family and so forth. But these are all laukika, these are all types of happiness and well-being that we receive from the world. When fortune smiles upon us, when we're experiencing good fortune, but of course good fortune doesn't last. There's good fortune, there's good fortune and then there's misfortune. And so we can ask, is there a, another dimension of sukha, of well-being, of happiness? One can also say wellness. That is not contingent on fortune smiling upon us. Or we can say from a Hindu and a Buddhist tradition, that is not contingent upon our good karma from past lives, ripening in this lifetime. Is there any dimension of well-being and happiness that doesn't come from, from the world, that doesn't come to us, but a quality of wellness and well-being that we bring to the world? And the answer is, of course, yes. And it's a discovery been made many, many times by great sages throughout, throughout human history. In the Greek tradition, I being a Westerner, then I must refer sometimes to my own native culture, in the Greek tradition, going back to Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they drew a distinction between the laukika sukha, su sukha, which they called hedonia, the kind of pleasure and happiness we get from the world, including not just sensual pleasures, but the pleasures of friendship, the pleasures of having happy children, of enjoying good health, living in a peaceful and beautiful environment. On the one hand, yes, that is certainly a value, but the ancient Greeks also recognized there's eudaimonia, genuine well-being. This goes back at least as far as Socrates. But before then, before the, the emergence of this Greek wisdom, before them was the Indian tradition of Buddha himself, Buddha Shakyamuni, and before him, centuries upon centuries of great yogis, siddhas, rishis. And before the Greeks made this distinction, before them, the Indian, the Sanskrit tradition, made the distinction between laukika sukha, and satsukha, sublime well-being, or samyak sukha, authentic well-being. These are terms we don't encounter very often even in Buddhism, but they are absolutely there. Whether we give them their traditional names, corresponding names in Tibetan, 
Dambe Dewa, Yang Dambe Dewa, Satsuka, Samyaksuka. So what type of well-being is this? This is a quality of well-being that we bring to the world. We don't get it from the world, we bring it to the world. And all of the great beings, the great rishis, the great, the great mahasattvas, the great saints and sages, they've all known this, and this is how they have blessed our world. So we are celebrating, celebrating wellness, but the laukika wellness, the mundane wellness, is transient. It comes and goes. There's a pandemic now. It will subside, but there will be another pandemic. This time it's a virus. Next time, perhaps it will be a bacteria that is resistant to all antibiotics. But in the background, what we as a human civilization are doing to our planet now is catastrophic. And I think we must not be distracted from that deeper reality that we are mistreating the world, we're mistreating other species, we are mistreating ourselves. And so what is all of this mischief? As the Solnit Dalai Lama often refers to people who are doing a lot of damage, bringing a lot of suffering to the world, mischief makers, so compassionate, but big mischief. Where does this all come from? When we treat each other badly, we treat our environment badly, we treat other species with violence, and it comes from our own minds. Clearly, it comes from our own minds. We experience physical wellness, we experience mental wellness. Physical illness, mental illness, or distress. Which of these two is the most important to us? And I think whether we are following any type of dharma or spiritual path, religious or not religious, we all value both. We would like to be well. We'd like to be feeling well and energetic and have good physical feeling, clearly. Physical, physical pleasures, nothing wrong with that. But if we had a choice if you could either be physically well, physically a lot of pleasure, but mentally distressed, depressed, angry, upset, ill, or would you rather be mentally well, kind and compassionate and peaceful, joyful, mentally, but physically not so good, physically ill, maybe old or injured? We'd like both, of course. We'd like to be physically and mentally well, but clearly everyone values more our mental well-being than the physical. We want both. We should do both, do all we can. But the mental well-being, most important, clearly. If the mental, mentally we're well, peaceful, kind, joyful, serene, contented, then the body is secondary. And the body will get old, and it will get sick, and it will die. But can we pass through the aging process, even give it getting sick on occasion, and even pass through death without mental distress. Can we mentally be well, experience samyaksuka, authentic well-being, even in times of adversity? And this is what the great spiritual traditions, the Dharma traditions of the world, have been teaching us for as long as there's been Dharma. But then this highlights the importance if mental well-being is even more important than the physical, although we want both. Mental illness, even more important, or mental distress, even more important to us than physical distress, then we must understand the mind. We must understand the true causes of genuine well-being and the true causes of mental distress. Most important, what is more important than that for all of us? Because everyone, even animals too, they want to also have mental happiness. Of course they want to have physical pleasure, not physical illness or injury, but above all mind, above all mind. And so what is our understanding of mind in this modern world, in this 21st century? Ever since the rise of Eurocentric colonialism, imperialism, then global culture has been strongly influenced by, often dominated by, Eurocentric civilization. Obviously, Great Britain, but also other European countries. And then as gradually as the United States grew in power, America has been involved as in, in, in imperialism and colonialism as, any, as much as any other Eurocentric culture. So what we're faced with in the global scene now is very, still very dominated by Eurocentric worldview and values, 
dominating education system in communist China, in India, in Southeast Asia, South America. The norm is really the Western model. As if the West invented higher education. But all of you who are familiar with Indian civilization, you know that's not true. The first European universities grew up in, oh, what is this? The, the, the 11th century, the University of Bologna, University of Paris, 12th century, Oxford University, 12th century. But long before these first universities in the West, there was already, at the time of the Buddha, Takshila, that was a university. And then when, when we look to the Buddhist tradition, Nalanda University established in the fifth century of the Common Era and continued on for 700 years, 800 years until the 13th century. This was a university, Nalanda University, Vikramashila and other universities, long before European universities even began, Indian universities had arisen and some of them were already in decline before the West even began. But now there's a major distinction here. In terms of the rise of modern science, modern knowledge in modern civilization, Western civilization, we really look to Galileo as the father of modern science. This is the view of Albert Einstein and many others. I think it's quite true. He was not only a great mathematician, but he was a great scientist. He developed the technology to move from simple stargazing, looking at the sky, the telescope, to actually fathom the nature of the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars. And so he began modern science with that. And for 300 years, with the rise of Western universities and so forth, then science became more and more dominant, especially in the 19th century, the mid-19th century. The mid-19th century was also a time when, for the first time, Western science became increasingly dominated by materialism, which is not scientific in any sense of the term. Materialism, that everything in the universe really boils down to configurations of matter, matter energy. The mind is just produced or an epiphenomenon of matter and energy. This, it is a, not a scientific view, it is a metaphysical view. And again, India preceded that, Charvaka. The Charvaka, it's materialism. And it preceded, it preceded Western civilization. And it was view, viewed in retrospect as the crudest of all the philosophies that came out of India. But now we have materialism that has come to dominate modern science, come to dominate Western academia, and I'm very sorry to say it has come to dominate much of education throughout the world, including Mother India. So the first universities founded in India under the British domination were founded in the 18, 1850s, University of Calcutta, University of Bombay, right when materialism was rising. So as you all know, the British imperialism and colonialism did bring definitely many hedonic or laukika benefits to India. Technology, the railway system, communication, of course you know that. But something very sad happened. India, I believe, has the greatest and the most ancient, and to my mind, it's my opinion, the deepest true science of the mind that's ever developed in human civilization. And why? Am I just like India more than other cultures? No. To explore the mind, to Alan? fathom the mind. Yes. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Can you speak a little louder, please? I can speak a little bit louder. Yes. yes. Maybe even a bit closer to the microphone. Surely. Thank you. Interrupt at any time. My point here is that India introduced something unique to human civilization. I think before any other civilization did, including China and Greece and the Hebrews and the Mayans, and that is the development of Samadhi. And so by the, Buddha, by the time the Buddha appeared, some 25, 2600 years ago, the discipline of Samadhi was already ripe and mature, and great discoveries had already been made by the great rishis, the great siddhas who preceded the Buddha. So he inherited that tradition from the first two teachers, the first two, two rishis or sadhus that he trained with. They were both masters of samadhi that had fathomed to great depth the nature of the mind, the human mind, where it comes from. 
discovering the continuity of a subtler stream of consciousness, call it jiva, call it atman, call it alaivichnana, call it subtle continuum of mental consciousness, they discovered this. This is not speculation. This is not religion. It's not belief. It was a discovery that you can make with samadhi, which penetrates through the more superficial levels of the human mind, which does arise independence upon the body, the brain. But this was an inner discovery. And since then, great yogis throughout the world, first Hindu and then Buddhist and Taoist, and then there were Christian and Jewish, and there were Muslim, Sufi, and many others, great yogis around the world, in all traditions. Even Pythagoras, the great philosopher, must have developed samadhi because he too said he could recall past lives and recognize individuals from past lives. He too said, yes, reincarnation, it's a fact, I've seen it. But now, with the colonialism, the expansion of Western notion of academia, especially from the mid-19th century, we've gotten the benefits of science, but with the mental virus, I'm sorry to say, but I believe it is, a very harmful mental virus of materialism that believes the only things that are real are material. The only evidence that counts is material, physical. This is like plucking out one of your eyes, so you see only a, a two-dimensional reality, and you don't see the depth of the mind of consciousness and its role in nature. But if we go briefly back to this extraordinary, true university of Nalanda, it celebrated five fields of science, five fields of, nunj, of knowledge, pancha vidya. And among the five, I won't give the whole list, among the five, one was central, and it was central from the beginning, back in the fifth century of the common era, but it was, sent, it was central to Indian knowledge long before the establishment of this university, Adyatma Vidya, the inner knowledge. This is central, this is most important in all of the fields of knowledge, of medicine, of arts and crafts, of logic and so forth. All of these are derivative and secondary, most important, the mind. To study intellectually with theories, with philosophy, but experientially study it with the power of samadhi, and so this was central, and so many discoveries had been made and replicated and replicated and replicated century after century by great Hindu rishis, by Buddhist rishis of different schools, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana. It was a great strength among all the fields of knowledge of India, the most important, most powerful, the deepest and most transformative was Adyatma Vidya, the inner knowledge, the knowledge of the mind, the origins of mind, nature of mind, the relationship between body and mind, the nature of consciousness. There was no mystery. There was no mystery. The mysteries were solved. What are the true sources of suffering, especially of mental suffering? The Buddha himself, as a great scientist of the mind and a reality as a whole, not promoting a religion or a belief system or simply a philosophy, but reporting on his discoveries, reveal the full breadth and depth of the reality of dukkha, of suffering, far more than most people even imagine. Most, so many people nowadays think is suffering to which we're vulnerable is just in this life, this candle flame, this flickering bubble, of this life, so transient, so short, and they think, oh, then no problem. When you die, then finished, all your problems are over. Oh, I'm so sorry. I wish that were true in a way. It's just not true. The evidence behind that is completely superficial and uncompelling. Yes, of course, there are mind-brain rela relations, cor correlation, excellent, but no one's ever found the correlation to mental consciousness. The brain correlation, they don't know, they haven't found it. No one ever found the correlate of this jiva, of atman, of alai vichnana, the subtle continuum of mental consciousness from lifetime to lifetime, because it doesn't need a brain correlate. So I'm sorry to say that as science became dominant in China, India, through all the continents of the world, with many benefits, many benefits of technology, wonderful, but it also brought with it as a parasite 
the ideological view, metaphysical view of materialism, which is not scientific at all. I think actually anti-scientific. It brought with it hedonism as the highest good is only hedonism. The highest good that science can ever provide it. It's just laukakasuka. Science doesn't help us with authentic genuine well-being. They're always looking outside. But the causes of genuine well-being are not outside. There are many outside contributing conditions to mundane pleasure. Of course, science has been very beneficial. The fact that I can speak with you now. Thank you, science. You don't have clairvoyance. I don't have clairvoyance or, or, or clear audience. So thank you, science and technology that we can share today. But what has science really given us? To help us be more virtuous people, more ethical people experience a deeper sense of genuine well-being. That was not its task. That was not its responsibility. And it does not contribute much at all to that. And so with the proliferation of Western-style education, it's also proliferated this triad of materialism and hedonism and consumerism. And this is what is destroying our planet now, undermining human civilization, destroying other species, destroying the natural habitat. We can't go with this Western model of education where the scientific study of the mind didn't even begin until 300 years after Galileo, late 19th century. And for a short time, 30, 30 years or so, 35 years, the first pioneers of Western psychology, William James, Wilhelm Wundt, Edward Titchener, they really thought we must take a scientific approach to studying the mind, and that's by looking at it with introspection. But they didn't know how. They knew they needed to train attention. They knew they did, needed to develop concentration, but they didn't know how. William James said, oh, I don't think anybody can train attention. This was because, I'm sorry to say, they were so ethnocentric, so caught up in cultural chauvinism, that they didn't even bother to look east. In the late 19th century, if any of these great Western psychologists went to India and they said, we don't believe it's possible to develop attention or introspection, they would laugh, yes? What rock have you been living under? We've been doing this for 3,000 years. Not only Hindu or Buddhist or Jaina or Sufi or Zoroastrian, we've been doing this. Have you been ignoring us all this time? And the answer is yes. We went there to colonize, to imperialize, to exploit. We as Western civilization did not go east to learn. We went there as imperialists. But now that really stopped. I went to India in 1971. I didn't go there to teach or to get money or to exploit. I, like many, many others, went to India to learn. Went to this refugee community of Tibetans to learn. And I've been le learning and learning and learning from the wisdom of India, the wisdom of Tibet, ever since as your chela, as your disciple, I'm still your chela. And so now the chela comes back to the master. The chela comes back to the mother, comes back to the root, comes back home. To tell you as an outsider, what have I learned? And what are the limitations? Western civilization has many strengths, no doubt. We can celebrate those too. Development of science and technology, Western philosophy, arts, music, literature, wonderful. Most of it's hedonic. But we also have deep religious traditions as well. But when it, when it comes to education, about 110 years ago, this introspective approach to studying the mind was snuffed out by the rise of behaviorism. They said, don't look inside, never mind. Look outside to behavior. And so from 1910 to oh, 1960s, then all the emphasis on behavior, as if you're going to understand the mind by just looking at behavioral expressions and thinking mind is just a predisposition for behavior. And then the 1960s, then neuroscience grew up. And neuroscience said, oh, mind is just a function of the brain. All mental disease is just a dysfunction of the brain. And so we compounded one superstition upon another superstition Mind is just a predisposition for behavior. We know this is foolishness. The mind is nothing more than brain function. There's no evidence for that at all. But this is the dominant view. And in terms of mental disease, still most of the money that goes for research and so forth is to find psychopharmaceutical drugs. 
billions and billions of dollars made in profit and people becoming more and more dependent on drugs, drugs, drugs for unhappiness, for insomnia, for attention problems, ADHD, for PTSD, for any kind of problem. We look to drugs and then many people look to drugs, including alcohol, and then pharmaceutical drugs or illegal drugs to find happiness. This is a very primitive approach. There are some aspects of my civilization, Eurocentric civilization, that are truly primitive and saturated by superstition. We need another view. And thank you, India. You're providing us with a deeper view that can complement the wisdom, the knowledge, the skills and discoveries of the West. But we need to revitalize this great contemplative science of the mind and the role of the mind in nature. So what have the Indians discovered? And then those who have drawn on Indic civilization of Tibet, of Mongolia, of China, Southeast Asia, spread throughout most of Asia, the wisdom of India. So I was asked to share my words of wisdom. I don't have any of Alan Wallace as one individual, my own little wellspring, my own little pool of wisdom. I don't think I have anything to offer. But it is my privilege and honor to pass on the wisdom that I have received from my Indian teachers in Sri Lankan and, Bur and Thai teachers and Tibetan teachers and Mongolian teachers and Bhutanese teachers. I can only pass on then maybe a little distilled essence. What are the true causes of suffering? And then that's not the brain. There's not one psychopharmaceutical drug developed with billions of dollars of research and marketed with billions of dollars of profit. There's not one psychopharmaceutical drug that cures any mental disease, not one. They only suppress the symptoms. And so that's not, that's just anesthesia. Whereas the Indian tradition, going back to the Buddha and before, the true causes of suffering are to be found in the mind. They fundamentally stem from not knowing avidya, not knowing what are the true causes of suffering, what is the nature of reality, what's the nature of ourselves, not knowing, and then moha, getting it wrong, delusion. All of the klesha, mental afflictions, stem fundamentally from not knowing and from getting it wrong. And out of this arises craving and attachment, looking on things outside and thinking, oh, that will make me happy. That's permanent. I can get sustainable happiness there. And then clinging to it, craving for it, being attached to it. So much more suffering from raga. And then when something gets in the way, we have obstruction or we get something we don't want, then we not only get unhappy, then we can get upset and angry, hostile, even violent. And so we have dvesha. We have anger, hatred, hostility. And these are the roots of all other mental afflictions, of jealousy, of pride, and so forth. We have found the true causes of suffering, and especially of mental suffering. And they're within, and yes, there are brain correlates, but they are just passengers. The true causes of suffering are not outside. They're not in the brain. They're in the mind. And so this is the diagnosis. The true causes of suffering but then we can say, is it just in human nature? Are we intrinsically created such that we must suffer? And the Buddha knew from his own experience, no. If you go to the very nature of awareness, it's luminous and cognizant nature. Awareness by nature is shutta, it is pure. And the natural purity of awareness is simply obscured by the avarana, the afflictive obscurations of klesha, which disturb the mind, upset the mind, distort our understanding and perceptions of reality. All the evil in the world, all the sin in the world, all the violence and harm we bring to the world, we human beings, other species also, all comes from ignorance and craving and hostility. And that's the diagnosis. Is there a possibility of being free? Yes. Yes, definitely. And that's what marga, the path, is all about. And it begins with shila. It begins with ethical discipline. And ethical discipline rooted in the wisdom of India is, first of all, all about nonviolence, ahimsa. I think India was probably the first civilization to emphasize ahimsa. Had there been wars and conflict in India? Yes, like everywhere else, of course. But the ideal to which we always come back is 
as Ashoka recognized. First, engaging in great violence, great bloodshed, perhaps the greatest king of India, who can say, but he was part of that, that violence. He was successful. And then with enormous grief, he said, oh, what have I done? So much bloodshed, so much suffering. And for what? No, we must shift. We must go back to our roots of the wisdom of India, starting with Ahimsa. Ahimsa is where we must start for all people, believers and religion or not believers, as His Holiness so often says, with his emphasis on ethic, secular ethics, that our ethics must not be rooted in one worldview or another. It must go deeper, that is universal. And we cannot be happy with each other. We cannot even experience mundane happiness, let alone genuine happiness, if we are treating ourselves, other species, and the environment with violence. Not possible. But then there are also opportunities to be of help, to help each other, help other species, to nurture and care for the environment. And so then compassion, benevolence. And that sums up ethics. Bottom line, nonviolence. When possible, be of benefit. Express your benevolence, your kindness, your compassion. And that's ethics. And from that, leading an ethical way of life, as the Buddha said, there is a quality of genuine well-being that arises from having a clear conscience because we've lead, led deeply nonviolent and compassionate, benevolent lives. This is the only hope for humanity that we come back to fundamental ethics that transcends any worldview, ideology, belief system, transcends materialism and religion. It has to be all-inclusive. But then we, again, looking to the wisdom of India, to Pandat, Patanjali, to Buddha, and to many, so many other sages throughout Indian history, <coughs> I think to an unparalleled degree, it was the Indian tradition expressed in academia through Nalanda, Vikramashila, and so forth, with their central understanding of mind, that on the basis of shila, of ethical discipline, of morality, then we can go even deeper in cultivating genuine well-being. And this is by cultivating samadhi, the higher training, the abhishiksha of samadhi, the higher training in samadhi, which definitely includes developing samadhi, single-pointed attention, deep meditative concentration, to fathom the nature of the mind, nature of consciousness, true causes of suffering, true causes of genuine well-being, and to recognize, if one has very deep samadhi, like the Buddha himself, to recognize the patterns, the natural laws of cause and effect from lifetime to lifetime. Many people outside who really don't understand meditation have no idea of the power of samadhi. Some even call themselves Buddhist or Hindu or what have you. Say, oh, no, no, reincarnation, karma, that's just Indian folklore. That's just Indian belief. This is imperialism. I'm sorry. This is imperialism. This is colonialism. I think it's racism. Oh, what do they know? What do those pre-scientific Indians and Tibetans and Thais and, and Sri Lankans, what do they know? They were pre-scientific. I find this to be only ethnocentric arrogance, pretending to be very modern, new form of Buddhism, secular Buddhism. I think, oh, what nonsense so proud of Western civilization, that we're better, we're better. The Western arrogance is something very shameful. And we use that as an excuse to colonize most of the world. That era must really end. Largely ended politically, but still by way of education. Still, Western imperialism still very dominant. So we should throw off the shackles of materialism-based education that has flattened our understanding of the mind to mere brain function, to mere behavior. This is superstition. This is not science. This is superstition rooted in a fundamentally delusional way and superficial way of viewing reality that everything that's real is material. What nonsense. We all have experience of our own minds. Our own minds have no material qualities, no physical qualities, and you can't observe them from outside. So it is the wisdom of the Buddha and the other great Mahasattvas of India that recognize the continuity of consciousness from lifetime to lifetime, recognize what are the true causes, not merely contributing conditions, 
of mental suffering and from lifetime to lifetime, the whole reality of dukkha. It is the Buddha and other great sages who recognize to find, to realize, experience deeper and deeper genuine well-being. You must start with ethics. You can't skip that. People meditate, but don't think about ethics. Oh, they're building sandcastles. Nothing sustainable there. Ethics is the golden ground, we say in Buddhism, of all spiritual practice. And of course, there are different ethical systems. But the fundamental essence is nonviolence and compassion, nonviolence and benevolence. And so we cultivate extraordinary levels of mental wellness, mental well being, by cultivating the mind. The Sanskrit term bhavana, bhavana, translated as meditation, means to cultivate. What civilization has brought greater riches to humanity than the breadth and the range of methods of cultivating the mind in samadhi? Cultivating the mind in wisdom, cultivating the mind in terms of the Brahma Viharas found in Patanjali Yoga Sutra, found in the Buddha Dharma, of Maitri, loving kindness, Karuna, compassion, Mudita, joy, empathetic joy, Upeksha, impartiality, e equality, of the equanimity of viewing all sentient beings equally as our brothers and sisters, all to be cherished equally. These are the treasures of Indian knowledge that were taught, disseminated, together with the Mahasiddha tradition, in the Buddhist tradition, the panditas, the panditas, the pundits in the universities, and the Mahasiddhas doing their own research. These two together, pandit and Mahasiddha, these two together are the tremendous strength of the Indian contemplative science of the mind. And so now in this 21st century, humanity needs you we must throw off the shackles, the handcuffs, the blindfold of materialism, hedonism, consumerism. It's killing us. And it contributed to this pandemic. It will contribute to more pandemics. And it's absolutely at the root of the way we are violating and destroying our natural habitat, our earth that we share with 20 billion billion animals and all of the other sentient beings here that we cannot see with the naked eye. India has treasures, but unfortunately, largely obscured by modernity, by Eurocentric colonialism, imperialism, and the notion the West knows best, that India must learn from the West. Okay, if you learn, you've learned, maybe you've learned enough. You can always learn more, but let us learn from you, because the wisdom about the nature of the mind the origins of the mind, where the nature of consciousness remains a mystery for modern science. They most of all, they acknowledge that, oh, consciousness is still such a mystery. It's a mystery to you because you don't know how to look. You have not developed this, the telescope of the mind, which is samadhi. You haven't even begun where India has maybe 4,000 years of history of developing that. And then through Southeast Asia and East Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, the wisdom of India has blessed all of Asia, most of Asia, Oh, more than 2,000 years. So it's time for the whole world to be blessed by this wisdom. Don't keep your, your lantern under a basket. Get the benefits of Western psychology, benefits of Western neuroscience, benefits of physics, chemistry, biology, all good. But don't let the wisdom of the mind of India be obscured by the superficial materialism of confining the scientific study of the mind to studying behavior and brain and giving other people questionnaires as if first person experience, your insights into your own mind are irrelevant and completely ignoring the enormous discoveries made by the power of Samadhi or in the Buddhist tradition, the union of Shamatha and Vipassana. Shamatha, methods for developing Samadhi, Vipassana, methods of rigorous, rational, empirical experience, research into the mind, and the union of Shamatha Vipassana. This perhaps was Buddha's unique contribution to the already immensely rich contemplative heritage of India, not only Samadhi, but bring together with Samadhi the active inquiry, the penetrating, investigating nature of mind. And so the Western tradition really has no idea. Science doesn't know where the mind comes from has not solved the mind-body problem, has not identified the true causes of mental suffering, 
has very little knowledge of the true causes of eudaimonia, and consciousness remains a mystery. They don't know where it comes from. They don't know the role of consciousness in nature. We are in a dark age. Eurocentric civilization is right now in a dark age about nature of mind, mind-body relationship, origins of human mind, what happens at death, and the nature of consciousness. We're in a dark age because of materialism and because we have not looked with humility to the wisdom of India, of China, Southeast Asia, Tibet, Mongolia. We've always approached, until very recently approached, oh, we will teach you, we will bring you white man's religion and philosophy and science and technology. We will educate you. Okay, thank you very much. Now maybe it's time for us to listen. Because I am Eurocentric, what can I do? My ancestors came from Europe, I had no choice. But I've been drinking from the well of the wisdom of India from direct sources, Indian sources, Nagarjuna, Shantideva, Chandrakirti, Buddha Palita, Padmasambhava. I've been drinking from that well for 50 years now. From original Indian sources, and then Bhutanese, and Tibetan, and Mongolia. So my life has been indescribably enriched by the wisdom of India, an Indo-Tibetan tradition, because that was the, the lineage, the school that my heart most resonated with. But it all comes back to India, to Buddha Shakyamuni, and the great Nalandu tradition, the great Pandit tradition, and the great Mahasiddha tradition, and the union of these upaya and pratnya, skillful means and wisdom. The wisdom to fathom the nature of the mind, origins of mind, nature of mind, mind-body relationship, the nature of prana. Western still has not discovered prana, or what the Chinese call qi, the Tibetans call lung. Still don't even know about prana. If you don't know about prana, you don't know how to solve the mind-body relationship. How does the body influence the mind? How does the mind influence the body? If you don't know about prana, because you can't measure it physically and objectively, then the mind-body relationship is going to remain a mystery for you, but has not been a mystery in India for thousands of years. Consciousness is not a mystery for thousands of years. The multiple dimensions of consciousness, not only individual continuum of consciousness, but then the deeper, deepest dimension in the Advaita Vedanta, the primordial non-duality of Brahma and Atman. In the Tibetan tradition, between Vidya, between our own human mind and primordial consciousness or Dharmakaya, Buddha nature, the Tagata Garbha, a dimension of consciousness that is beyond all conceptual constructs, beyond one and many, beyond existence and non-existence, the ultimate ground of being that is non-dual with the deepest level of energy and the deepest dimension of space, Dharma Dhatu. This has all been discovered and the benefits have all been come forth so it's a time not to feel now India superior to everyone else, but for the huge, for coming together. And it's in this spirit of coming together that I've been striving for 13 years to create a, a, a research facility, but not just scientific, primarily, in fact, a facility for contemplative research. And now after 13 years of striving, finally, just in the last few days, my, my Dharma friends and I, we have purchased, the Santa Barbara Institute has purchased 110 acres in the state of Colorado, in the, rock, in the Rocky Mountains, in the United States, pristinely beautiful, magnificent, with Dharma centers, Hindu and Sufi and Tibetan Buddhist, multiple Dharma centers. It's like a, like a pure realm of multiple Dharma centers from multiple traditions. And now we will come there. We have come there to create a center for contemplative research where we will train yogis, aspiring yogis, to spend months and years in full-time professional training, developing the good heart, developing the four Brahma Viharas of Maitri and so forth, developing samadhi, developing mindfulness, smriti, introspection, samparajanya, developing attention skills, developing empathy, to develop exceptional levels of mental wellness and well-being, to fathom the nature of the mind, to fathom the ultimate source of genuine well-being, which is that deepest dimension, 
the divine, the transcendent, the universal, that transcends the limitations of all the individual religious traditions of the world. It is the common ground, the ultimate nature of reality in which consciousness is utterly central, utterly central. So a place for, to do research like this, nothing new, and yet there are very few places like this, design, entirely designed for people to be li live and full-time practice, 10, 12, 14 hours a day meditating, but bringing in scientists, inviting scientists, knowing that you may meditate a lot and never learn about the brain. That's fine. But the scientists know much about the brain. They know much about behavior, cognitive psychologists, clinical psychologists, also physicists. A number of physicists now in the field of quantum mechanics, quantum cosmology, are recognizing, oh, for the whole history of physics, whole history of science, we've been ignoring something. And that's the role of the mind, the role of consciousness in nature. We've been treating like that as if it was insignificant. Because after all, Western science developed and evolved for 300 years, ignoring the mind. And then for 30 years, they started looking inward to introspection, and they gave up and went right back to studying behavior and brain and still have not developed a rigorous science of observing the mind directly. But this was Galileo's great breakthrough. If you want to understand this, the earth, the, the moon, the sun, stars and planets, you must look at them, but not just stargaze, like folk, uh, folk stargazing, but you must develop the appropriate technology to fathom the nature of the stars and so forth. And Samadhi is the telescope for fathoming the nature of mind. And India is the mother load. And the, and the West, we are your chela, we are your disciple. We're beginning in kindergarten. And so this center we're creating is to draw on the wisdom of, of India, of Nepal, of Bhutan, of Sikkim, of Tibet, of Mongolia, to draw on the wisdom of China and Southeast Asia, of Sri Lanka, to draw on that wisdom, but then invite the scientists to come together. Now, instead of just the scientists studying the brains and behavior of meditators, and studying their physiology and the impact on the immune system and what it does to the brain, all very well, but what has that really benefited anyone? Does anybody meditate better because they know the brain correlates of what happens when you're meditating? I don't think so. It's, it's a curiosity. Where's the practical benefit? The benefit comes from meditating, right? Bhavana. Meditate. Cultivate your own mind. Otherwise, you'll never know. Just be hearsay. But the scientists do have strengths. The physicists have a great tradition of fathoming the nature of the physical universe in which the role of the observer seems to be more and more important, but you can never understand the role of the observer, the nature of measurement, the role of consciousness, unless you look at the mind. And India is our guru. Other cultures also, China has a 5,000 year civilization, Southeast Asia, and so on, definitely. But India, you are a mother. We need to revitalize, bring about a renaissance of contemplative inquiry in Hinduism and Buddhism, Christianity and Islam and Taoism and all other traditions. We must complement science, which is so good at looking outwards to the physical, the objective and quantifiable, and helped us so much, definitely, for Laukika Sukha. Very good. But that's not enough. We are destroying the planet. And if we are going to overcome this tendency, this trajectory, this momentum, that will give rise to one more catastrophe after another, slowly maybe drying up the, the rivers of India and how many hundreds of millions will, stuff, will suffer and starve and die because we have been violating our environment with a global climate change. So we are creating the center of contemplative science to bring together scientists bring to, and train and bring together contemplatives so the contemplatives learn from the scientists and the scientists learn from the contemplatives. And then we'll bring our, our discoveries out and apply them in education, in mental health, in business, in all other fields of activity, of human endeavor, to turn, turn us around, away from this trajectory of catastrophe, of violation and destruction of the environment, and wars upon wars where human ingenuity is going to make more and more weapons of mass destruction as if this is going to benefit anyone. As His Holiness said, we should just stop. We don't need more weapons. We can't afford more wars. We have enough problems to deal with just in terms of the impact 
of our own way of mistreating the environment. So this center we're creating, the Center for Contemplative Research, there is a, a website you can check called centerforcontemplativeresearch.org. This is all coming overwhelmingly from the wisdom of India. I'm a messenger just bringing this to the modern world. I have many wonderful relationships with scientists whom I deeply respect for their open-mindedness and their intelligence, the rigor of their methodologies. It is time to come together. And not just for Buddhism. I'm emphasizing that which I know most. But the tradition of Samadhi far precedes Buddhism. And His Holiness Dalai Lama has given us a mission statement. He knows about this, has blessed it, given his endorsement. He said, definitely, but go back to the the tradition of Ahimsa, of India that precedes Buddhism, go back to that. And also bring in the study, investigation, the collaboration with Christians. And if Christians, then of course, with Muslims and Jews and people of all different contemplative traditions, religious traditions, we are facing unprecedented challenges on this planet. And we brought it upon ourselves, especially it is since the last 150 or 60 years with the rise of materialism and hedonism and consumerism, where the notion is if your gross domestic product is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, this is how, how a sign of success, that your economy is healthy. But this is superstition. How can we have 7.8 billion people consume more and more and more celebrating consumerism and thinking this is going to turn out well? This is again superstition. The superstition of materialism and hedonism and consumerism. And so I speaking as a human being now, not just as a Westerner, I'm speaking as a human being. India, you have a wealth of wisdom. Do not let your own wisdom be obscured by the thin layer of modern academia that was introduced to you by the white man in the 19th century. Value what the West has brought you, but now time to celebrate your own wisdom and make it accessible. Work with Indian scientists and Indian contemplatives. Help us, and we can help you, and develop a whole network of centers for contemplative research where scientists and highly trained contemplatives come together to, un to heal the mind, to heal the planet, to heal human civilization. We need to bring forth unprecedented solutions of the union of science and spirituality, of East and West, ancient and modern, we must all come together, huge, to solve the unprecedented challenges and crises that are facing us now and will definitely get worse. It's not yet completely catastrophic. We still have civilization, but we have to act very, very quickly to turn around the trajectory, to reverse course, and to emphasize authentic well-being over mundane pleasure over the pursuit of wealth and power and prestige and fame. It is urgent and it must be global. And I look to India, share your wisdom, share your wisdom, please. We need your wisdom urgently. We need a renaissance of Indian contemplative wisdom, as well as that of China and the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims. So that's what I wanted to share you, with you today. I hope it's useful. And so, now time maybe for some discussion. I said, uh, just listening to you, I mean, there are almost tears in the eyes because these are words that we've been all wanting to hear. <laughs> I'm your Chela. I sound like a teacher. I'm always a student, like my own Lama, my own Guru. Always a student, this only Dalai Lama. You always come to humility, simple Buddhist monk, always eager to learn. I'm 70 years old. I've been learning from India for one half century. I want to learn more. You're like so, a, you're, you're 70 years young. You're like this non <laughs> but you throughout this talk, which has been a, one of the most electrifying presentations of this uh, global festival, you were like this uh, shining warrior out there, ready to smite any kind of darkness. Pick up whoever, <laughs> <laughs> pick up whoever is lying down, and say, "Get up! It's your time now. Move." 
So uh, thank you very, very much. I mean, we're extremely um, grateful for this, uh, these soul nourishing words that have, uh, that have re-sparked or rekindled a uh, spark within many an Indian heart that is smothered by so many other external variables. So uh, we are extremely fortunate that you accepted. I think it's a blessing because the Dalai Lama had uh, blessed this program on the inauguration day. So your coming at the end of this festival almost is like again a, an invigorating reminder of the importance of this message to reach out in the world far and wide. Uh, there are many participants who are echoing my words and equally emotional with the words that you have shared with us today. And um, it's also a very historical day today because in the, they have just in the parliament accepted the national education policy, the new one, which mm -hmm. has been revamped, re which has relooked at uh, many of the education frameworks. I request Vinay to share a little more about it because he was a member of that drafting committee. He has been a close uh, contributor to the formation of that. Vinaya? Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Sava Mangalam. <laughs> Thank you, Amin. I don't think it could have come on a better day uh, because this morning <clears throat> we had a session with uh, Professor M.K. Sridhar who was the member of the drafting committee of the new national education policy. And last couple of days, we had discussions on the education. In fact, uh, how do we bring in the yogic wisdom into education? And today, as the icing on the cake, we have your presentation, which creates such a strong argument in favor of bringing in contemplative sciences. And uh, the new national education policy of which uh, I had a small role to play, uh, has brought in a lot of emphasis on these knowledge or wisdom traditions and how it should be integrated into the present system. You know, and I've spoken of higher education, Nalanda and the un Western universities of the Sorbonne, Oxford and so forth, but we mustn't begin there when people are, young people are already 18 years old. And that is, there's so much that is not an attempt to convert children to Hinduism, Christianity, but rather, again, universal. And so the Dalai Lama has often commented that all of modern education is focused outwards to simply making a living, to external prosperity and so forth, which of course is very good, nothing wrong with that. But from kindergarten, from age four, age five, children can also be taught how to develop attention skills, emotional balance, empathy, good heart, ahimsa. That's not just Hindu or Buddhist. And so being taught ethics, all of this can be taught in the sense of secular, Indian secular, not American secular. American secular means keep religion and government in, entirely separate, like to a cat and a dog. Don't let them fight. Put it, the dog in the kennel and the cat in the cat kennel because they you know, fight. But in India, you know, going back to the principle of Ashoka, secular means equal respect to all religions. That's good secular. And so that secular could be taught in every school in India and should be taught in every school in the world because we want our children to be able to rise to the challenges, economic and medical and environmental that we have given them. So it's not enough just to give them skills to make a living. We need to help them develop inner strength and equilibrium, good heart and exceptional mental health and well-being if they are going to be able to deal with the challenges we've given them. So it's for everybody, all schools in India. <laughs> yes, we have, uh, Vinay, you want to say something? No, I just wanted to say like, uh, <clears throat> the policy has been accepted by the cabinet as a new national education policy. And this has come in after nearly 30 years. We had the previous policy that was there on, in, uh, that has come up in 1992. And this is the next policy. And hopefully this will lay uh, strong foundations for a proper integration of both the inner and the outer sciences. And that, that too, that's something that can start at a very young age too. So sure. we are very hopeful on that account. It might take its own time, but uh, it couldn't have been more timely to just to hear your words today and uh, feel the, uh, I mean, just even more convinced about what 
we have we have been thinking about you know many problems psychological problems can be prevented just like people give inoculations or vaccines so you don't get a particular disease so likewise children should never have to fall into adhd because you can teach them very basic practices of mindfulness of samadhi when they're very young there's good research of how do you teach a five-year-old how to develop concentration, introspection, mindfulness. They can be taught, and then it's got giving immunization shot so they won't get ADHD. Depression is the most debilitating disease on planet Earth now. And materialism is incredibly depressing. It tells you life is meaningless and when you're dead, you're terminated. It's, and you're just a brain, so you have no free will either. What's more depressing than materialism? And then they wonder, oh, why is it depre depression is such a global epidemic? But children can be taught without necessarily Hinduism, Buddhism, how to develop a sense of confidence and meaning and so forth. So they never get depression. They don't have to suffer from general anxiety disorder or insomnia or PTSD. We can help children as we help them develop physical health and physical hygiene. As His Holiness often says, also develop psychological hygiene. And immunization. So even if they encounter very belligerent people with strong craving and toxic nationalism and hatred and get those mental viruses, they witness behavior and harmful views and it's, they don't get infected. So much potential here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In the... In the Upanishads, they say that uh, pashati, sah pashati, the one who sees, sees. And your seeing of this reality is so obvious, and which gives power to and conviction with which you speak. I think that this session should really be made a compulsory one for all teacher training programs. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not I, I really think we should, as Indika Yoga, start a petition on that one and make this a compulsory lecture for all young, all our teachers and all our students also to get exposed to, just to know the wealth of uh, insight and uh, fundamental knowledge that existed in this civilization. And which is good as a human being. It's not a cultural, it's not a requirement. This is important for us as human beings to practice, to understand and practice for ourselves. So we have Ramuji, who's a very senior sadhaka from the Swami Vivekananda tradition. And he's saying, was that not a modern Swami Vivekananda speaking after 125 years of Chicago? <laughs> <Not a mastak. laughs> and we've got many uh, like dittos under that and saying that your the words were almost like the wake up call of Swamiji where he says, arise, awake and stop not till the goal is reached. So you have a lot of, uh, a lot of gratitude pouring in, in the comment section. Uh, there were some questions. Would you like me to uh, take on some questions uh, for you? So there is oh, there's one question uh, by Ramakrishnan ji. He's, he's been inspired by your, uh, your sharings. So there was one that he was, it's a technical question where he's saying the Astika traditions focus on rediscovering our essential or blissful nature using meditative techniques and thereby mitigating suffering. The Buddhist tradition focuses on existence of suffering and develops approaches to remove the causes of suffering. Does that difference in approaches make a difference in terms of actual meditative practices in either tradition? I think we have one more thing to celebrate. <laughs> we, we don't have just one religion, that everybody, like one size of shoe. And whether you have small feet or big shite, well, never mind, here's the best shoe, and it's all size 11. <laughs> so we don't have any one tradition that's the best for all. And so I find very interesting the Buddha's approach. Because if we look at it from a very modern kind of marketing perspective, we say, this is not very good marketing, Gautama. You're starting with suffering. People want to hear something good and not just suffering. And they want to hear about virtue. And then you talk about klesha and karma. And so it's a little bit, some people, when I first learned about Buddhism in Western University, they said, Buddha's a bit pessimistic. But you know, India is quite a poor country. <laughs> and so, no, this is complimentary. And that is what is quite not so obvious is if, as the Buddha taught in his first turning of Wheel of Dharma, we first focus on the reality of suffering, which we already care about. There's no human being, no animal, no deva, there's no sentient being that doesn't care about suffering. 
And if you care about it in your intelligence, you must look into the causes and not just say, oh, may suffering go away, I hope it goes away. No, you need upaya. You need skillful means. You need knowledge to know what are the actual causes of suffering. So he addressed questions everybody is asking. Even animals, if they're hungry, they're asking, where can I find some food? Even animals want to know what are the causes of suffering and how do you overcome suffering? So he started out with something utterly universal for materialists, atheists, theists, and non-theists. There's a reality of suffering. We don't want it. If we don't want it, we can't just say, please go away and run away. We need to know the true causes and not the outer contributing conditions. But then what is remarkable is if you just eradicate, cut from the root, the inner causes of suffering, then you are reunited. You achieve nirvana and you find, you discover immutable bliss, immutable timeless wisdom. And so all you need to do is dis dispel the obscurations and that which the other, the other traditions are focusing on explicitly, it comes naturally and effortlessly. So I think the two are utterly complementary, but for the last 30 years of my training that has been quite single pointed, I've been focusing on the Indo-Tibetan tradition of Mahamudra, and it's called Mahasandhi or Dzogchen, the Great Perfection. It's a, a lineage within Indian Tibetan tradition. And it's in, in the spirit, in the taste of it, it's much more similar to Advaita Vedanta, that it's focusing overwhelmingly on this deepest dimension of consciousness and the need to settle the mind in its natural state and to rediscover who we have always been rediscover the ultimate ground, which is always the ground, and our human mind, even the jiva that goes from lifetime to lifetime, that too is a creative expression of the transcendent divine ground. And so this has absolutely captured my heart. And I've been focusing single-pointedly for 30 years now, since 1990. And the, the spirit there is, having 20 years of the classic foundational Buddhism, Four Noble Truths, then saying, but what positive what positive, and then this, the source of all well-being, the source of all virtue, the source of all genuine happiness, the source of all virtue, all comes from this ultimate ground. And all we really need to do is to know who we are. So in Dzogchen, it's often said, there's one difference between Buddhas and sentient beings in samsara. Buddhas know who they are, and sentient beings don't. Quite simple. And then, so reminiscent, I think, of many things you'll find in the Upanishads, in the Danta, and so on. Then we say, ah, the deeper you go, the closer you converge. And that is my fundamental belief for 50 years now. Superficial, many differences. No problem. It's good. Everybody can't wear the same size of shoe or want the same clothing. You start different. Your clothing is very different from mine. I will not wear a sari. So I don't think it would look, look good on me at all. It's okay. But the deeper we go, the closer we come to true union of all sentient beings that transcends all differences. Yes, I guess it's like the spectrum of light. The more you go to the source, the more it becomes white. So, Indeed. yes. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. That enlightening answer. Um, there's another one uh, here, which has to do with religion, because we are, religion is, such, is one of those very, uh, foundational lenses that we view the world through. It's a very subconsciously cultivated lens, I would say, and coming down through generations. So there's a question by Gita Ramanaji, who's a very frequent participant on this festival. So she's saying religion was exploited to divide us during British rule. And now, and now for many of our leaders, this wisdom can only be shared after we, how can this wisdom only be shared after we rise above this. And uh, there's a sort of related question by, um, wait, there's a related question by Ramakrishna Sitaramanji who's saying again, he says, do you think prophetic monotheistic traditions will find Hindu Buddhist meditative practices compatible with their own? Hmm. Really the religion oh, when it comes understood. to- Understood. Understood, two very, very meaningful questions, They're quite distinct. As a scholar, educated until the age of 20 in the West entirely, in, in Europe and America, and then went to Asia, 14 years total immersion, 
and then trying to bring back, bring the two together, going to Amherst, Stanford, and trying, because when I went to India and was living there in Dharamsala, I would often say I was born at the age of 20, because nothing made sense until I came to India and was living with Tibetan culture. Nothing made sense, so I, I, but of course that's not true. So then I tried to integrate ever since then mm -hmm. the wisdom of the West and the wisdom of the East. But something that's been very vivid to me for a long time is we say religion is the lens through which we view reality. It's a Western lens. It's not Indian. That is, in the Western, we have three Western lenses. Of course, there are many more, but we have three. And that is, we have religion. But the Western concept, the English, German, Spanish, French, the European concept of religion is entirely based and rooted in the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They are religions. They're not philosophies and they're not science. They are religions. Good, they are religions. And then we have Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Kant and so forth, and those are philosophies. They're not religions and they're not science. And then we have Galileo and Newton and so many, by, you know, Darwin and Einstein and so forth, and they are not philosophers and they're not religious proponents. They are scientists. But these are three categories that are entirely Western. And then with the colonialism and the linguistic imperialism, we take our Western categories, which are true for all Western, Western languages, and then we say, hello, China, we're going to fit you into our boxes. Hello, India, hello, Tibet, hello, any traditional culture. And so Westerners come to India in the 19th century and they see monks, they see people wearing robes and burning incense and chanting, oh, okay, we found the box for you, you're religious. And then many, until very recently, many philosophers say, oh, India didn't have religion, didn't have philosophy, because their philosophies were religious, Nagarjuna, Shankara, and so forth. Uh, then it's not real philosophy, because it's, it's tainted by, contaminated by religion. And then, of course, it's not scientific, because where's their technology? Where's their where's objectivism? Where's their third-person methods? Where's mathematics? So, no, no, India didn't really have science, didn't really have real philosophy they just have religion but then i have my phd in religion religious studies and religious studies for many people outside of religious studies is considered oh yes that's the department for superstition because <laughs> that's what the materialists think and materialists are dominating modern academia so outside of religious studies hardly anybody takes religious assertions seriously they say oh that's just religious belief hindus believe this buddhists believe this but it's all blind faith and reliance on authority whereas we scientists we will tell you what's true this is just to use a nice word complete racist ethnocentric nonsense the word that i use a lot it's my in my heart is dharma and I know Dharma has different meanings in Hinduism, but the Dharma, as I learned the term, and in Tibetan, sure, direct translation, when early 70s, when I was just immersing myself in the wisdom of India by way of the rich Tibetan culture of the last 1,200 years, all rooted in India, I'd been studying Dharma for maybe a year, and then I, taught, I went to my, my lama, my guru, one of my many gurus. I've had maybe 50 gurus by now. Narayan Ananda was my swami who taught me to taught, pranayama. Narayanananda, great, great sadhu. I, I met him in, De in Delhi, and I've studied with teachers from Sri Lanka and, and Thailand and so on. But I asked my Tibetan Lama, I'm very familiar with this word Dharma, but what does Dharma really mean? And they said, Dharma is a way of viewing reality and engaging with reality that gives rise to genuine happiness, genuine well-being. Now, what is that? Is that religion? Mm -hmm. Is the reality of suffering religion? Is the reality of the, the, of the true causes of suffering? Is that religion? How about Shila? Is that religion? How about Samadhi? Is that religion? How about Prajna? Is that religion? And so in Buddhism, in, in India, I come back with reverence. You never cut up knowledge into these pieces that look like they're antagonistic with each other. Religion versus science, which is true. Oh, they're so different. What do we do? Well, we either throw out science and become religious fundamentalists, or we throw out religion and become materialists. And then philosophy, it seems like they never agree on anything. So even though they have a lot of wisdom, they, all, they disagree among themselves because they don't have the upaya of Nagarjuna and, Shant and, and Shankara and Sri Aurobindo and so many others. They had philosophy, but they had the upaya of samadhi. And they could put their theories to the test of experience and philosophers never do. 
They come up with one more bright idea after another, and then they all debate. And it starts with talking, and it ends with talking. And so Dharma, which is the native Indian culture, which we cannot translate it into any Western language. There's no translation, though I just say Dharma. But there are elements of Dharma that are clearly religious, and I celebrate those. There's faith, there's devotion, there's worship, there's blessings, there's ritual. There are elements of Dharma that are definitely religious. Wonderful. And they differ, of course, from even from Samkhya to, Vedaita, you know, to Vedanta. Of course they differ. But in each of the Indian traditions, there's also philosophy, the rational, logical investigation, hittu, hittu vidya. And that's true for all of them. Even Charaka, materialist, they also advocated with reason. And one of the celebrations of India is it never happened that demanded uniformity and homogeneity. Everybody now has to follow this tradition. Even when the Muslims came in, they didn't try to convert everybody to Islam. They wouldn't succeed anyway. So they had to face reality. Okay, anybody who wants to become Muslim, become Muslim. But there are Hindus and Jains and so forth. So India, from the very beginning, the, the most ancient time of civilization, always pluralistic. Always pluralistic. Has been, is, is, been, is now, and will be. So I, I say a little bit with my tongue in my cheek. If you try to make Indians all following the one religion, it's, trying to, like, it's like trying to herd cats. <laughs> You'll never do it because they don't want to all have to follow the same. Whereas in many, many Western countries, one religion comes to politically dominate all the others. And you must conform, otherwise you can be burned as a heretic or sent in exile, excommunicated, and so forth. This is a real problem of Western Abrahamic religions. They tend to be, we have the only way. We have the only way. Whereas what Hindu has ever said, we have the only way. I'm following Shiva. I'm following Vishnu. I'm follow, following Mahakali. But then you can't say one way. <laughs> when have the Hindus ever said, oh, you giants, you're all heretics. You're all going to hell. Never. And the Hindus embrace the Buddha as, good, you're following seventh incarnation of Vishnu. Welcome to the family. <laughs> good. Good. <laughs> And so, Dharma, please don't be seduced by Western categories and thinking you have to fit into those boxes. You never have, you don't now, and you will not, because you have larger boxes. Whereas in Dharma, there is science. There is science in Dharma. You're using samadhi to make discoveries that are replicated and corroborated by other yogis if they have sufficient training. There are many elements that are absolutely science. They're empirical, they're rational, they give rise to discoveries that can be replicated. They can also be refuted if you know how to probe deep enough. And that's how science works. And, science, and India, I think, inve in, in, invented philosophy. Who has more ancient philosophies than you find in India? But it's always been part of the empirical and it's always been part of religious. So Dharma is holistic. It has religious elements, philosophical elements, and scientific elements, but beautifully they're all integrated. Unlike Western religion, Western philosophy, and Western science, they're all in three different rooms trying to talk across disciplines. Well, you didn't make the different rooms in the first place, so you don't need to talk across disciplines. <laughs> now in terms of, yeah, and so then in terms of upaya, the methods of yoga, the asanas, the pranayama, the pratyahara, the many methods of shamatha, vipassana, and many, many other practices, the tremendous richness and diversity of bhavana within the Hindu, multiple Hindu traditions. Again, that's a Western category, isn't it? It's a Western category, trying to put all of Indian religions into one package. It's one more Western colonialism. Buddhism, okay, that all traces back to one person. So, okay, we can call it Japanese Buddhism. It's okay, they're very different. But yes, they all revere, we all revere Buddha. But in terms of methods, there are quite rightly, wonderfully, there are, there are methods of rituals, of meditation, of devotion and prayer that are uniquely Hindu or followers of, Vi of, of Vishnu, of any other of the great divine beings. And they're different and they should be different. And then Buddhists have their own rituals and Buddhists have many methods that only a Buddhist would want to do. And that's fine. Vajrayana, Zen, Chan, Pure Land School. Well, no non-Buddhist is going to follow the Pure Land School of Chinese Buddhism. And that's fine. But in the midst of those methods, rituals, methods, meditation that are unique to Theravada Buddhism and not found in Mahayana, found in Tibetan Buddhism, not in that Buddhism, in addition to those, there are foundational practices I've been teaching for 44 years now. And that is 
the cultivation of samadhi, of shamatha, of smriti, of mindfulness, samprajanya, introspection. These are universal. Everybody should do these. Every child in school should be taught this. And, and contemplatives in all traditions, they also have distracted minds. Also, the mind falls into, into dullness and laxity. So everybody needs that, right? Of shamatha. And then we have the cultivation of the heart that we see in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras of Maitri, of Karuna, of Mudita, of Epeksha. You don't have to be Hindu, you don't have to be Buddhist, you don't have to believe in God or karma. These are universal. And then teachings on ethics and how to write, recognize what is ethical and what is non-ethical. And of course, you may say, I believe because God said, or Allah said, or because there's bad karma. It's good, no criticism. But here's one way that is universal. I didn't invent it. But as I engage with you now, and I engage with everybody else listening, are my words, my facial expression, my tone of voice, the movements of my hand, are these conducive to your genuine well-being? Do they nurture you, support you in not getting sensual pleasure or just intellectual stimulation in entertainment? That's trivial. But is my conduct here, the time I'm spending with you now, is this helpful, nurturing? Am I a friend to you in helping you cultivate your own genuine well-being, rooted in ethics, rooted in cultivating the mind, rooted in wisdom, which is where you find the highest, the highest degree of samyaksuka, is by knowing reality as it is, are my words helpful? Then they are kushala. They're virtuous, they're wholesome. Whereas if I behave in any way, with speech or even with my intentions or with my body, if I behave in any way that undermines, detracts, destroys, inhibits your cultivation of, of genuine well-being, that's akushla. That's not virtuous. Any act of violence, any act of arrogance, of greed, hostility, manipulation, exploitation, sexual, monetary, any way that is not helping you, and it's coming, and then why would anybody ever behave that way? Why would we ever treat others in a way that would harm their own cultivate, their own well-being, their wellness? Why would we ever do that? That's crazy, isn't it? There's enough suffering from aging, sickness, death, natural calamities, catastrophe. There's a, don't we have enough suffering already? So we don't need to give more to each other. Why do we do that? Why do we still have more weapons, more violence, more racism, more nationalism, toxic nationalism? Why misogyny, treating women as inferior, treating animals as if they have no feeling, treating each other, sometimes reducing each other as we're not even human? Why do we do this? It makes the gods cry. Why do we do that? It's destructive for ourselves, destructive to others. Why do we do that? Avidya, moha, because we don't know any better. And we become prisoners of our own mental afflictions. We become slaves of our own ignorance, our own arrogance, our own attachment, self-centeredness, our own violence, our own anger and hostility. We look like, we think I'm free. I can wage war. I can do this. I can exploit other people. I can make for my wealth, my power, my fame. I'm so free. No, you are a puppet. You think you're free. This is like a puppet on the end of strings and just moving around like a puppet. And the puppeteer is your own mental afflictions, your klesha. You are a puppet of ignorance. You are a puppet of delusion, moha. And so anything that will cut through ignorance and delusion and methods that are universal from Hinduism, all of yoga, so much of yoga, anybody can practice. And so much of meditation also. It's good for everyone. It could be taught in every school. And then those practices that are unique to this tradition, that tradition, good. That's for Muslims. That's for Hindus, that's for Jews, all good. And then we look at the differences, not putting our eye, hands over our eyes and say, oh no, I don't want to see a difference. It's all one, we're all following the same. No, we're not. On the superficial, it's wonderful that you're wearing different clothes, not my clothes. I wear my shoes, not your shoes. I follow my tradition. I'm not trying to follow all the traditions. I respect all. And knowing that my, and this is very important, the tradition I'm following is the best for me. I know that. It's where I'm at home. It speaks to my heart, my mind. I'm at home. I didn't convert to Buddhism. I discovered, oh, I've always been a Buddhist. Thank you very much for bringing me back home. You know. And so, emphasizing above all, the common ground, what unites us all. It's deeper than any of the differences. But when we know, when we have confidence and faith in that common ground, that you're my sister, you're my brother, I'm your brother, 
common ground with animals too. They're my friends. They're my relatives too. All sentient beings are all my friends, all my relatives. I'm a friend to everyone. They may not be friends to me. That's okay. But I can offer to the world. I'd be a friend to anyone, right? That's common ground. And when we have that confidence, yes, at all, at fundamental, we all want the same thing. We love virtue. We love love. We love compassion, kindness. Everybody values that. We all want to be free of suffering. We all want to find happiness. The causes are the same for all of us. When we know that, and then I say, oh, I think maybe you're not Buddhist. Or maybe, oh, no, you don't look like me. I have, I'm not white. I'm pink. Look at my face. I'm not white. I'm pink. <laughs> Special race. Maybe pink people should be superior. <laughs> crazy. As crazy as thinking white is better. So it's the notion of pink is better, or brown is better, or black is better. This skin pigmentation, biggest superstition is racism. And so when we have that confidence in the common ground, then we can be so much at ease with the differences of the different religions and different denominations and sects and so forth. But that's, what they, that's best for them. For many people, Hinduism is best. Christianity is best, not Buddhism. For many, many, Islam is best. Wonderful, celebrate. If we know one. So, both. We've got requests from the audience. They don't stop him. This is like, you know, Amrita Varsha. It's like the raining of nectar. So don't stop this. <laughs> yes, I was, it's just, I, I think that the, I think India's time is in the air. I think it really is in the air because in different forums, this is the kind of voice that is being heard. This is the, this is the need of the hour. And uh, just in fact, before this, I was in another session uh, for an international conference on, it was called Shankhana, the Dialogues for Rejuvenation in the Education System. So the Canadian call for rejuvenation. And we had a professor, Subhash Kak, do you know of him? I think I've heard the name, yes. Because he's very much in these same lines and he spoke a lot of the things that you have mentioned in these tones that, you know, there was no science and India needs to wake up to her own scientificity of her tradition. And uh, so it's just very really interesting that it's in the air. So I was wondering if, you're, not wondering, in fact, it would be great again, another petition to make you a permanent advisor on the Ministry of Education. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they invite me, I have, if, if they invite me, I have no choice. I have to accept, but maybe yeah. if they don't, then that's fine too. Because, because a lot of participants are saying that, you know, the Anil Kumar is saying the Wallace vaccine is all curing. And so your presentation is, being experienced as a kind of uh, injection that you know that it cleanses us of our um, the, the viruses of the past the colonized viruses because india while we have moved on with independence for over 70 almost 80 years now we have not let go of this colonized mentality that is like a rabid cancer actually across the nation um, and it, it, speaking just outside of india just for a moment it makes me very sad that China, with its 5,000-year-old history of Confucianism, Taoism, the richness of, of Chinese Buddhism, and its arts and its culture and its heritage, it makes me deeply sad that this great civilization has been dominated now for 60 years, seven, no, 70 years, by a Western philosophy of materialism. Marx, he's German. He lived and he studied in the British Library. And his views now have been dominating China and they think it's Chinese and it's Western imperialism by way of materialism. There's no school of, of, of Chinese Dharma, Chinese philosophy. None of them are as crude and primitive and as destructive as materialism. So the materialism that dominates Chinese education, I'm very sorry to say, you have also continued to succumb to Western imperialism. You want to, have to celebrate Chinese culture and you do it under in the prison of Western materialism. So wake up. China, to your own heritage, much richer than anything that comes out of science or materialism. So very strong. <laughs> the age of, age of materialism must finish now because that age of materialism is exactly what is destroying China and India and the whole planet. We have to throw off that shackle. Yeah. High time. It's very interesting that there was a question by one of our participants, Shanti Kumarji, also regular attendee. She's saying, what about communism? So she had that question. But it's, uh, I would like to add here that I have a very close friend, a very, very dear friend, in fact, who's a very staunch communist. And uh, what she, what she, when, when we discuss about it, she invariably says that 
many of the ideas of Marx, if you read him in his original, are, are also said to have inspired, um, you know, the need to go beyond differences in terms of class differences, in terms of awakening people to environmental realities, to make them more sensitive to all of that. So how would you, from a larger perspective, uh, place the communist ideology in this discourse? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I myself, I'm a socialist. Mm. I see too many disadvantages of capitalism. So I cannot say I'm a capitalism. It's too exploitative, too harmful in many ways. I just need to fix my computer here. And so I'm a capitalist. There are advantages, but it's so aggressive, so competitive, exploitative, and so damaging the environment. I, I am not a capitalist. I'm a socialist. But in what way? I agree with what this person said about much of the writings of Marx. He was responding to the savage exploitation of the proletariat, where they're being treated as like animals, worse than animals, as just cogs in a machine for the capitalist people on top to get all the money, which is what's been going on you know, for more than 150 years. You know that eight people now, the eight richest people on the planet, have the same amount of assets as the 3.5 billion people who are the poorest. Now that's not because of communism. That's because of capitalism, gone rampant. And what can those eight people do with 80 billion, 90 billion, 100 billion? What can, who can spend that much money? They should give it all away and keep maybe two or three million. That should be keep them happy for life and give everything away because three, five billion people are living on one or two dollars a day. Well, they have all that asset. They can't even imagine how to develop. So I'm very strong critic of uninhibited capitalism, which is sheer exploitation. And that's which what Marx, out of his compassion, saw that people being degraded by capitalism that exploits the poor, gives them no rights, all for the benefit of a tiny few. So I'm a socialist. The reason I don't call myself a communist is because it's closely related with Marx. And even though he had many wise and compassionate things to say, he had zero appreciation of Religion, he said, religion is the opium of the people and zero appreciation of the wisdom of any of the great religious traditions of the world. And he was a materialist. There's no doubt about that. And so everything goes down to matter and so forth. So it's very good for increasing the hedonic pleasure of the masses. So they're not exploited as much. They can make a living, grow, increase of the middle class, which India has done. But I can't, if you give me a piece of food there's 90% really good food and 10% poison, I won't eat it. And the notion that religion is the opium of the people, it's only bad, 100% bad, and materialism is the authentic view of reality, well, that's the 10% that poison. And then when the Dalai Lama met Mao Zedong in 1954 or so, then he had what was first a very pleasant meaning, and Mao Zedong showed respect, and he was very impressed by Mao, how he really tried to help the people. There seemed to be a lot of material, a lot of altruism, caring for the exploited, the terribly poor, increasing the economy for the benefit of all. And then just before he left his meeting with Mao Zedong, then Mao Zedong told him, you know, religion is poison. And then that was the end of the Dalai Lama's becoming Chela to Mao Zedong. Oh, so you, when, if you believe that, then what will you do with our civilization when you take it over? And of course, what they did is destroy all the monasteries, genocide, killed so many thousands of their great lamas and so forth. Cannot call myself a, a communist because done under the name of communism. And the brutality of communism in the Soviet Union, they call it communism, but in fact, especially under Stalin, that was capitalism where one man owns everything. Some people say, who are the richest people in history? Probably Stalin, because he owned everything in the country. If he wanted to take anything from anybody, he could. And if people disagreed, he killed them. He killed 20 million of his own people. That's communism, rooted in materialism, which has no ethical basis at all. Materialism is amoral. It follows only science, only the laws of nature, and the laws of nature are amoral. And that has been the characteristic of communist dictatorships, whether North Korea or communist China or Soviet Union and so forth. It's the morality of the jungle. Those in power get to exert their will on those who have less power. 
So because of all of that connotation and the associations of communism with materialism, with amorality, and treating religion, all religion, as enemy and suppressing and obliterating, I can't call myself a, a communist, but I can call myself a socialist like that of Sweden and Norway and New Zealand, to a large extent Canada, which I absolutely embrace. I feel very strongly that a country that does not take care of its poor, does not take care of its elderly, and does not ensure that everybody has access to medical care, they have to be rich. A country that doesn't take care of the ill and the poor and the weak and the children and the elderly doesn't take care. That society does not deserve to be colonized. It's not civilized. And so I am very sorry to say, in America, we have no universal health care. And so there are elements of my beloved country and not so beloved government nowadays, where I say, what, what happened to American civilization of treating our other countries with respect and treating the poor with respect and treating people of all color with respect? Well, we've never really done that, as we know with Black Lives Matter. So maybe we're becoming a little bit more civilized not judging people by their ethnicity, their, their skin color, and so forth. These are not signs of civilization. These are signs of savagery that makes us in many ways worse than animals, because I don't know any animals that are racist. Yeah, I think we should have a special contemplative centers for the political class <laughs> independently. <I would> say. <laughs> wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody going for elective office that number one, they should really be show that they're psychologically fit, mentally fit, and they're truly coming into politics for the job description of be of service to your country. And we know without mentioning any names, there are world leaders who are mentally unfit. Mm -hmm. Mentally unfit. They are not mentally well. And I won't say any names because it's not just one person or two persons, but such people should never be put in power. The higher the power you have, the greater your altruism should be like King Ashok, great power and great benevolence. After his dark time, that's the model. So if you want to be just a city councillor, then you don't need to have too much. If you want to be a governor, you have more. You want to be member of parliament, more. If you want to be prime minister or president, you should have very great mental health and balance and very, very great altruism that cares not only about your own country, which is your responsibility, but recognize your own country does not exist independently. The environment is not located in countries. The economy is not located inside countries. Ethics is not inside countries. India is multi-ethnic, always has been. America is multi-ethnic, always has been. And so the notion of we are best, I want to make one final point, and that is among the kleshas, mental afflictions, that which is called pride, is a sense of I'm superior, or my group is superior, in, you are inferior. I'm superior, my gender, my race, my skin color, my society, we're superior, we're better than you. And that's a mental affliction. So that's toxic. That's just like hatred and greed. I'm better, so everybody's inferior to me. That's, that's a mental affliction. It's not true, mental affliction, but there's something else. And that is, there's a term that is confidence. Shantideva in his great Bodhicharya Avatara, Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, he comes to the, the seventh chapter and it's all about virya, enthusiasm, determination, inner strength, effort. And he really highlights the enormous importance of developing confidence. And confidence is not arrogance. It's not pride. It is, it can be like, parents can be very proud of their children. That doesn't mean they think their children are better than other children, but they see their children being virtuous and accomplished and capable and doing their best and parents' pride in their children is a good thing. If you are a very gifted artist and you take pride in your art, you're a musician and you take pride in your music, you're a politician and you take pride in the way you're serving your constituency, serving your country, that is a virtuous pride. It's confidence, it's noble, and it's not setting yourself up above, but it's saying, I have offered something to a world that is a value. I am a person and I am a value, and I'm not inferior to other people. In some skills, definitely. I have less skills of, in many, many areas, less than, but that doesn't make me an inferior person. And no race is inferior. No country is inferior. And so we can have pride. And that's, again, basically the gist of what I'm saying. India, rise and rediscover your confidence that you have something of magnificent value 
in some ways unprecedented and unparalleled. And the other civilizations, even China, got most of its samadhi from India, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, its samadhi, its wisdom from India. We know that. Hinduism is not only in India, you know that, Southeast Asia and so forth. And likewise, Christianity has shared much of its wisdom with the world. That's good, you know. But having confidence without pride or virtuous pride without toxic pride, and that's what India needs. Rise up to the glory of India without pride, without feeling, oh, yes, now good, we're superior to the West, we're superior to China, we're superior, no, no, then it's the same problem all over again, reverse imperialism. True. I mean, that's a very tricky thing, a balance that everyone should be mindful of. Indeed. But that's what we're here for. My name, I'll say a little joke. I'm yes. known as B. Allen Wallace. B. Allen Wallace is my plume. That's my name that I'm known with my and so forth. B. Allen Wallace. If you want to do an move the letters, it's balance walla. <laughs> balance walla. I'm a, a merchant, a, a, a merchant, a street seller of balance. Balance. Because we, we, we need this in the ecosphere. We need this in politics. We need this in economy. We need this in our interrelationship with, with different cultures and, and countries. We need this internally of balance, balance, balance. And balance you cultivate with bhavana. And bhavana is what all of education is about, to cultivate the mind so we be greater service to ourselves and the whole world. So I'm balance wala. And that balance is samatva, that is yoga. Indeed. <laughs> yes, same. Different faces of the same jewel. Thank you very much for this uh, very powerful, yet a very logical analysis and uh, uh, estimate of various isms that have come in and uh, uh, bothering the humanity rather than empowering and uplifting humanity. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of this might have had certain uh, places in the evolutionary, I mean, they might have had their own evolutionary role, but we should also recognize, this, recognize that it's a time to move beyond them. To, to evolve beyond anything we've had in the past by drawing on the wisdom of the whole world and not just one culture. Absolutely, we need it. This is not a luxury. I don't think this is optional because we follow the trajectory we're on right now, dominated by, frankly, Western materialism, hedonism, consumerism, that China's adopted, India's adopted too much, America, of course. Mm. If we follow this trajectory, we are doomed. That's not being melodramatic. That's just fact. We are doomed if we follow the present course. It's very obvious. The pandemic comes and goes, but the trajectory we're following is self-destructive. So we must stop. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I also just would like to mention with, I mean, something that you highlighted it, and it's so important. The uh, understanding of the concepts of dharma and religion. It has become such a confused concept even in India to the extent uh, like this term secularism has been translated as dharma nirapeksha without respect for dharma. And it, oh, oh. It, <laughs> so Marx, I mean, Indian, back to Marx again. Indian mind was so tuned to understanding of dharma. Like we might not uh, understand the word ethics, but the moment you say dharma, anyone who's even uh, non-educated, who has no a, any proper formal schooling can connect with that idea. And yes. can make a will to say, okay, I, I should lead my life in a dharmic way. But if you, uh, the elite of the country decide and they use this term uh, that without being dis disrespectful, or, I mean, respectful of dharma or without considering dharma, we lead our life. It, it's such a pathetic situation. So both uh, the whole idea and the translation, I mean, that's the word that is used for uh, translation for secularism, dharm nirapeksh. Like equating the word dharm to religion is a very big problem that has happened here. It's a very serious error that we should take dharma out of science, dharma out of society, out of the government system. This is like saying, yes, I want to live, I just, but I'll just have a heart transplant and that is take my heart out. <laughs> if you've left True. dharma, then how do you survive without dharma? Because dharma is the very nature of finding genuine well-being and that's what we all want. And so fact, stick, with, stick with your own categories. They're much better than these fragmented ones from the West. And that the is, whole word dharma comes from the root uh, mm -hmm. which means that which sustains and nourishes. 
So you are taking out something that nourishes and sustains, then what will live? I mean, it's, it's a really a big problem. I learned that by way of Tibetan. Tibetan true doesn't have that connotation, but dharma means to uphold, to nurture, to hold. And so what do you say? This is like a baby saying, I want now no more mother's arms. <laughs> yes. I'm going to be secular, no mama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. Tragedy of our times. But hope They're things will privilege. change. And so again, once again, I have to say, in just not humility, but honesty. I really had no wisdom of my own to share. Because when I was listening to my own voice, I'm hearing the voice of the Dalai Lama and so many other gurus I've had from India, from Sri Lanka, from Thailand, from Tibet, Mongolia. And all you heard was a chorus of the wisdom of my own gurus. And all I am, just, I'm just, just a messenger. No huh? wisdom of my own. So namo to all my gurus. Namo to India, the wisdom of India, Tibet. And may we all come together and save ourselves and our planet. True. Yes. I mean, that would be a brilliant note to stop, but there is just an important question that I thought uh, would be worth asking you. In fact, there was a comment and also a question. Uh, the comment is by Avinash Srivastavaji. He's saying that science without samadhi, because we do need to cultivate the scientific temper. Yeah, but yes. Not in its reductionist form. So science without samadhi is dangerous and samadhi without science is unspeakable. <laughs> very nice, very nice. I utterly agree, because if one, if all that comes out of samadhi is, it's ineffable, it's inconceivable, it's utterly transcendent, well, that's fine, but then you can't talk about it. Nobody knows what you're talking about, unless they've had realization themselves. And science is articulate. A scientific discovery is not a scientific discovery until it's published. If you discovered yourself and you don't tell anybody, then it's not even considered a scientific discovery because you need, and nowadays in the modern world, if you make a discovery, you submit it to a scientific journal, it goes under peer review, and if it's authentic, then they publish it, and then it's a discovery, you know? And so it's a very interesting point I've never thought of before, that science without samadhi. Science does have samadhi to some extent, that is, scientists can con concentrate to some degree, but I think there's a very deep reality here. And I know from myself, when I was a Buddhist monk studying physics and mathematics at Amherst College, I was a Buddhist monk. I was meditating many hours a day while studying mathematics and, and quantum mechanics and relativity theory and so forth. And, and I was also studying philosophy and I was translating a text from Sanskrit, so I had a very unusual undergraduate education. But what I found again and again is when I would set my studies aside and I would just go into samadhi, just into cultivating shamatha, quieting the mind, developing samadhi, and not thinking about science, not thinking about this problem, that problem, but just going into a very deep and quiet and clear space. Time and again, countless times over years, the fresh idea, the breakthrough, the creative idea comes out of that stillness and that, that quiet. And that's where intuition comes from. So Einstein had a lot to say about this, one of the most brilliant of all times, and that is imagination is more important than knowledge. And where does imagination come from? Not by thinking a lot. That's where, okay, we develop business plans and strategy and all of that. But the intuition, the creativity, the depths of insight spring from the mind that is balanced from samadhi. And India knows how to cultivate samadhi. And the West, there are simply some individuals like Kant, and ancient times, Socrates and other great scientists, Einstein himself, they have exceptional abilities to concentrate. Now, William James, he's one of my heroes from the West. He was utterly ethnocentric, too bad. But so he never looked to India, he ignored Asia. Well, that's what they did back then, well, to a large extent. I know he had a contact with the Indian yeah. Swami, I know that. Swami he did, we yeah, but he didn't, I know he did, and he had respect, but he didn't pursue it. He wrote he the didn't book. Pursue. He wrote the book, Varieties of Religious Experiences After That Encounter. And oh, I've studied it very carefully at Stanford. It's a wonderful book, wow. but, he didn't, but he didn't really go there to learn because he knew samadhi was very important, attention very important, but he didn't look. Have the Indians developed any methods? He never did that. But nobody else did in the West either. We're too caught up in we're the best, we're the best. But this point is very deep. And that is if we consider that even a sniper, a sniper, Okay, he's going to shoot a person from 1,000 meters. A sniper has to have very good, very good concentration. And many others, weapons, you have to be, if, you, if you're in, in a sword fight, or you're flying a jet at 500 miles an hour, and you're in a dogfight, fighting with, you have to have very good samadhi, otherwise you die. 
So in military, you need to be concentrated. Air traffic controllers need to be concentrated. Professional chess players need to be concentrated. So, but if it's just concentration and it has no roots in ethics in Sheila, it's not sustainable. And this is the wisdom of India. We know from Patanjali, Yama, Niyama, and then Asana, and then Pranayama, and then eventually you get to Dharana and you get to Samadhi. But Samadhi in the Hindu tradition, Buddhist tradition, to develop sustainable Samadhi, sustainable exceptional levels of mental health and, and, and balance and wellness, it can only, that plant can only grow in this fertile soil of ethics. And it's just true. This is not a religious statement. And that is, if I'm going deep in samadhi, and then I come out and I try to exploit you, or cheat you, manipulate you, lie to you, or have violence, if I do that, that blows up my samadhi. You cannot maintain samadhi and have an unethical way of life. It's not just because God said so. That's just like you can't grow plants in arid, dry soil. They'll be there for a short time. You plant them, they'll be good for a day or two, and then they're dead. And so samadhi is sustainable and transformative if and only if it's rooted in ethics. Now, this is a crucially important point. If you look at the history of science, Galileo, deeply Christian. Kepler was tra trained as a, the a theologian. Copernicus was a theologian. Newton was deeply religious. And that was true for many, many of the scientists. Descartes, very religious. Until the mid-19th century. And Darwin and the rise of materialism and then science cut away from Christianity and the ethics of Christianity, which is very good. Nonviolence, love, compassion, it's good. It's good ethics. Science had roots in ethics, didn't always honor them, but they had roots because they're all Christian. And then mid-19th century, the rise of materialism, then science cut loose from any ethical foundation because there's no ethics in materialism. Zero. And science has been materialistic for 150 years. And therefore, we saw, especially in the First World War, now materialism is utterly dominating Western academia. And all the Germans and all the English were all fighting in, in the name of God and country. They're all sure they had God on their side. So religion was not helping. But who, what was it that enabled the First World War to kill 20 million people? How could they kill so many? No war had ever killed that many people. How in four or five years could they kill so many people in such a short time? Because the scientists gave them all the weapons. They gave them all the guns, all the artillery, the bombs, the airplanes, the poison gas, the chlorine gas. The scientists and, tech and engineers gave them all the weapons. And that's what turned this war into the bloodiest war in all of human history. And by the time we get to the Second World War, we killed 80 million people in the Second World War, directly or indirectly as a result of the war. The 20th century was an, a century of unprecedented violence and inhumanity of man against man, and they were mostly men, not women. And it was science and technology that enabled them to be so efficient in destroying humanity and continuing to be so efficient in destroying the habitat, the natural, the natural world around us. It's science and technology. No science, no technology. We couldn't be this efficient in killing each other, killing off other species, and destroying the environment. Now, does this mean science is bad or technology is bad? No, no, we've got many benefits, but it has no ethical basis. There's no fundamental ethic, ethical basis in modern science. They just have a little bit of treating your subjects in a psychological study with you know, some respect. There's hardly any ethics in science. You can, you can be a scientist and be working for Stalin, working for Hitler, working for any of the great, and they have given their talents to the great tyrants over the last 150 years. Leonardo da Vinci did. There was no ethics there. He wasn't really a Christian. And so science by itself has no ethics. It has no samadhi. Scientists can be as mentally unbalanced as anybody else, as politicians and so forth. And so science without mental health, science without samadhi is indeed crippled. And it's dangerous because all that intelligence, all that pratnya, instead of being good, put to the use, the benefit of humanity and the world, which is the greatest use of our extraordinary human intelligence, instead is used to make more weapons and that technology that we don't need, that doesn't really contribute to human well-being, just continues to consume the natural resources of our planet. So he's right. Science without ethics, science without samadhi, gives rise to mad scientists who have no ethics. And they'll, they'll work like mercenaries, 
for the highest bidder, whoever gives them more money, they say, okay, they, I give you my brain, I give you my intelligence, and I'll give you all my in invention. Give me some money, and you can destroy, destroy the planet as much as you like, as long as I get my money. So many scientists are very ethical. I'm not judging science. I'm not judging scientists. But it's a fact. There is no samadhi, and there is no, there's no cultivation of samadhi, and there's no genuine ethics in science. And unless it finds ethics and samadhi to partner with, Science and technology will continue to be the tools with which we're treating each other with great violence and treating other species and the environment with great violence that will destroy them and, of course, destroy us. So he's absolutely right. I'm his follower. I'm his chela. <laughs> There's a lot of requests in general to know how to be the chela of the chela. So I'll come to that part of it. But uh, the other question, I mean, the last question that I'll put here today is related to this uh, Center for Con contemplative studies that you have started, the contemplative observative, observatory. Uh, but mm -hmm. the point is that, and taking on from the, or taking the lead of the discussion on science, we see that society more and more is becoming lopsided towards the scientific, uh, or the need to study science rather than arts. Uh, mm -hmm. And in whatever one does, be it psychology, be it uh, social sciences, anything, there is always the need to uh, validate knowledge with science yes, yes. Um, but now i'm wondering because i'm also part of the indian psychology movement mm -hmm. and one of the biggest challenges that we face in this particular approach to understanding human nature is that a lot of the experiences that are being discussed by the yogis etc are internal they're subjective in nature right. so how do you propose or what methods do you propose what first-person methods do you propose uh, an individual can use to study the inner nature with the scientific, uh, you know, with all the rigors of science yeah. on one side? And the, if I may just also add a request there, is that we've had people who, we've had uh, many participants who've joined along on this festival for the last now 39 days. And um, we have also made a call for being an ambassador of wellness. Mm -hmm. We said, you know, that's like an offshoot of this uh, festival because it's sure. to celebrate wellness. So how can, we, how can we become ambassadors of wellness? And I think one of the important things for becoming an ambassador of wellness is how do we implement these teachings in our lives, but how do we keep track of our progress? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's very important to recognize this. I would just like to come in for a moment uh, because uh, uh, we had set up a center called Center for Indian Psychology in one of the universities in Bangalore and we were trying to publish papers. And uh, wherever we sent the papers, we were hearing back from them, it's a very good paper, but maybe you should publish it in a religious journal. We were trying to get them published in their psychological journals. Yes. And uh, the journals or the writings that we always looked up to were your writings. Mm -hmm. We were trying to see how you present, how do you bring it out. So that has been a very good support and guide for the work that we were doing. So you're hearing the British speaking through that person. <laughs> because, oh, this is not scientific, this is religious. So it's the British categories being superimposed on Indian academia. Really enough already. Britain, you can keep your academic tradition, but don't spread your viruses to us, please, because we have our own tradition that's just much older than yours. Yes. And so, but it's a serious question. And it's the commonplace, the kind of the received wisdom or the general assumption is, well, religion is very interior. The great saints, the great sages, the pundits and so forth is all. So they get a lot of benefit. But science is what is really practical. Science and engineering and technology and studying law and education and politics. This is what really matters in the world because this brings about real change. Whereas the yogi up on the hill, well, that's very nice. We will offer flowers at his feet and very nice. And we will enjoy receiving darshan from the yogi. And thank you very much. Now, okay, bye-bye, bye, yogi. I have to get, make a living and I have to help the world again as if the yogi is just sitting there to smile at you. So we have very primitive notions of what it means. Well, let's just take one example, Dalai Lama. When he came down to India, he had basically no money. He's not extremely handsome, nice looking, but not a, not a movie star. He has no power. He's, you know, he's, he's, he was a, he's a Lama who's lost his teaching, he's lost his country. And so he was just a, he really was just a simple Buddhist monk. He had no power, really. 
had status. He's just a monk. He had no money. And yet, there he is. He's one of the world, most world-famous people on the planet. Nobel Prize, Templeton Prize, Congressional Medal. He's revered all of the world. He's one of the most influential voices in the world. And how is that? Because he has so much power. And in this case, it's so obvious. There's such compassion there and such humility and such wisdom and focusing on nine violence and focusing on compassion. But anybody can say those words. The Dalai Lama's words are not unprecedented, many of them. But he embodies everything he says. I've known him for 49 years. I met him one-on-one -on -one in October 1971. There's no difference between the words of wisdom and compassion that he articulates and what he embodies. People would just sit with him, like so many other whole beings, and receive darshan just sitting with him, and they feel blessed. They see his smile, they hear his laughter, they just, just with him. And so he's a Dalai Lama, so he's a saint, he's a great being, no doubt. But this shows that he's not going, he's never gone around trying to convert people to Buddhism. Definitely not. I don't want to convert you to Buddhism. Go to your own tradition and go deeper. If you really feel you must be drawn to Buddhism, well, then okay, that's your choice. But he's had this enormous impact on the world, not because he is the Dalai Lama of Tibet, not because he has power or wealth, because he embodies like all of the great say, saints, the sadhus, the rishis, the mahasitvas, he embodies this and it expresses itself in his actions. So he's taken a tiny group of Tibetans who are crushed with genocide, savagery, fleeing for their lives, being shot down as they were leaving Tibet, fleeing from Tibet, coming to Dharamsala, where I came in 1971, only nine, 10, 12 years after they had fled from Tibet, I'm living in a refugee community where everybody had been through trauma. Nobody had a happy walk out of Tibet coming to, to Nepal or India. Nobody. And they all lost their wealth. There were no wealthy people in McLeod Ganj, in Dalamzala, no wealthy people. It was just, how poor are you, you know? But he transferred with his leadership and other lamas. He, not alone, but other lamas, he told everybody, no hatred, no violence for the Chinese. This is just our karma ripening. Feel compassion for the Chinese. There are brothers and sisters and only gratitude for India. Otherwise, we've lost our civilization. He taught they all, all the lamas taught them the same voice. No harbor, no resentment, no violence, no retaliation, no hatred. Just have courage, have determination, have pride in your own culture. Restore our monasteries, our schools, our arts, our medicine. And you know how fabulously successful they've been. Indira Gandhi noting, whoa, those Tibetans, you've progressed so quickly. Well, they're not better than Indians, but they had the leadership that invigorated all of them, gave them confidence and courage and enthusiasm and faith and a sense of confidence in themselves as Tibetans. And so the cultivation of meditation, the cultivation of bhavana, cultivating the mind, not only cultivating externally, because science, engineering, technology is very good for laukika sukha, but only for that. And that's very important for health, communication, education, and so forth. Very important. Science, very important. But it, that's, we can ask this question. What is more important for human civilization that we treat each other ethically, that we treat the environment ethically, treat it, other animals ethically, nonviolent, treat other human beings of all ethnicity? What's more important than ethics for our survival and our flourishing for all people, not only religious people? What's more important than that? And what has science contributed to ethics? Are we more ethical now that we've had 400 years of incredible progress and proliferation of science? Wonderful. We have this technology. I'm very grateful. I'm in good health. I would have died when I was a baby because of a hernia operation. Hernia, I would have died. So if no science, no medicine, I would be dead when I was two years old. So I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. So for good health, for economics and all of science, very helpful. But can we honestly say, that since the rise of science with Galileo, that we are, from century to century, we're more and more and more ethical. Can anybody believe that? When we killed more people in the 20th century than any century preceding, using the tools of science and technology, are we more ethical? The answer is useless. Technology, useless. Okay, well, how about mental health and well-being? Are we mentally more healthy, more balanced, having greater sense of well-being, more compassion, are we healthier now than we were? Oh, no, actually, mental disease is on the rise. 
And how are we primarily treating it? With drugs. Thank you, materialism. You're suppressing the symptoms without ever getting to the why are we depressed? Why do children get ADHD? Why is there anxiety? Why is there so much stress? Why? Science is not doing anything. Failure. So for ethics, failure. Genuine happiness, failure. Mental health and well-being, failure. Now, that doesn't say it hasn't succeeded elsewhere. But throughout human history, what are the forces that have been most supportive of compassion, of ethics, of mental well-being? Dharma. Mm. Whether it's that of Socrates and Aristotle, whether it's of Shankara, whether it's of Dalai Lama or Mahatma Gandhi, where do we get our ethics? Not from science, not from technology. We have poor ethics now, less mental health and well-being. And as the economist will, will tell you, when people are depressed, they're much less productive. Yes. And they're much less creative. And if they're anxious and depressed, and if they're hostile and impatient, they will not do as well in the world. They'll not be as good as students. They'll not be as good teachers. And so for anything else to work, economics, science, technology, education, politics, anything to work, you have to have dharma. Mm. Otherwise, your, otherwise, your intelligence will become under the domination of klesha, and you'll respond with arrogance and, and selfishness and toxic nationalism. So no dharma, no civilization. Yes, uh, but there was just one thing that without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, there is the scientific temper. And I think just listening to your talk, we recognize the importance of having a very sharp or a very, you know, very sharp intelligence, a very, a lot of clarity in recognizing, in having that viveka to know what is right, what is not right, no ati vyapti, not, you know, over making simplistic generalizations or judgments really to hold, uh, to be on the razor's edge when gauging the world, to know exactly what is right or not. But so I was wondering, like with the contemplative uh, laboratory that you are doing, how can we use that in the inner world? And how are you going to measure that? Like, how are you going to gauge that a person is becoming more? Because yeah. in the Gita, when uh, Krishna was asked the question, you know, like how does a realized soul move, sit, talk? What are the external uh, symptoms or the external signs of a sthita prajni, of the one who's established, he completely, uh, you know, he puts it aside, puts up, puts the behavioral component aside and talks about the inner qualities. But how would you know that a person is becoming more compassionate and it not being a pretense? How are you going to ensure that? I'm glad you insisted on having one more, one more question because we're not finished. Without that question, then it's not finished. We're not complete. And that is, I've emphasized, as I intended to, the importance of bringing forth the wealth of India and the importance of contemplative inquiry and dharma for science for modern world. I've already made that point. But now here's another point I didn't say anything about. Does dharma, do contemplatives, do yogis, do they have any use for science? And what we can say, I will not speak about Hinduism because I've not been very well trained there, only a little bit, but Buddhism, 50 years. Mostly Tibetan, but also Theravada, Mahayana, Multiple schools within Tibetan Buddhism. What is often lost by people who are very deeply religious and have very deep faith and devotion and do ritual and meditate and so forth, what is very often lost is that critical, critical, intelligent mind. And so often really practicing out of blind faith. Oh, my Lama said, there must, must, must be true. It says in the Gita, it says in the Dhammapada, it says, oh, it must be true my tradition says it must be true and we just accept blindly and a lot of meditators they're just doing rituals and visualizations and, and right reciting mantra 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 and that's nothing wrong with that it can be very bit but what is missing in a lot of hinduism i believe in a lot of buddhism is what about that critical inquiry what about the cultivation of prajna intelligence discerning intelligence what about that? If you meditate, can that actually lead to discoveries about the nature of mind, nature of reality, or is it just upaya, make you more friendly, more ethical, more compassionate? So now we have a divide. Scientists get the knowledge and religion gets compassion and ethics. That's very common. We don't really have anything to learn about the reality from religion, but we want compassion and ethics, so we better have it. But if you want to know what's really going on, then ask the scientists. This is a West, once again a Western cut that science has no compassion, has no ethics in and itself, doesn't promote it either. 
But then religion has no real insight, investigation, and so forth. But one, one of the earliest books I read on yoga was Taimi, Taimi's book, The Science of Yoga. It's a good book. He, he, he had been trained in science. And I said, whoa, this is before I was really looking at this in science. I said, whoa, there's a lot of science in yoga. This is what needs to be revitalized. And that is this element of critical inquiry and making discoveries. But then we say, but isn't it all interior? Well, not really. And that is if one cultivates these inner qualities, then your sheer presence will have an influence. And the way you treat animals and other human beings, the kind of politician you will be, the kind of educator you will be, that will have an impact. I'll give one story if you have a short time. When I was at Stanford, at Stanford University, I went into the bookstore, big bookstore, Stanford University bookstore, and I wanted to buy some pencils or something like that. And there was a woman there who was just selling stationery and pencils and so forth. But I was so, and, but she, there was something about her. I was so impressed. I just went to buy some paper or something, totally ordinary. But I thought, wow, that woman's quite remarkable. Okay. It wasn't attraction. It wasn't that at all. Zero. I said, wow. She was so kind. So there was just the way she was engaging was so kind. It was so, so good. I thought it was quite remarkable. And I bought my pencils and went away. A month or two later, I was reading in the Stanford Daily Newspaper. Somebody wrote a whole article about this woman who was a salesman in the Stanford bookstore. Other people had noted this too. A kindness, a warmth, an openness a gentleness, and they wrote a whole article about this woman who was just selling pencils. So her occupation is completely ordinary, but she brought something extraordinary to it. And there are some politicians and educators not uncommonly, and some scientists, of course, and other people in the medical profession, some are just so compassionate, they heal with their compassion. So it does come out if you develop deep transformation, true bhavana, of cultivating the good heart, cultivating intelligence, cultivating inner peace, cultivating mindfulness, this will naturally, spontaneously, with never showing off, this will show in the way you engage. And whether you're simply, simply and very difficultly, a, a mother of just taking care of your children, or whether you're doing something very ordinary, a farmer or marketing, selling this, a chaiwala and so forth, you'll bring that to every profession. But now coming back again to this very important point, when I speak of a renaissance of contemplative inquiry, trying to catalyze a revolution in the mind sciences, but a renaissance of contemplative inquiry, going way back to the rishis long before the Buddha came. But the Buddha made his discoveries by inquiry, not just by resting in peace or becoming very, you know, very transcendent. He was asking probing questions, probing questions. And so when a yogi makes a discovery, only that yogi makes that discovery. But in the Hindu tradition and the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, we know this is true. The great yogis recognize other great yogis. They know who is the creme de la creme, the cream of the cream. The highest ones recognize, just like the, the, science, the great scientists, they recognize other great scientists, but those below them can't evaluate those above. The higher realization can evaluate those with lower realization. Great yogis can recognize and appreciate yogis who are not so accomplished. People with no background maybe not recognize the yogi at all, just, oh, very nice man. I heard somebody listening to the Dalai Lama, and he came out of the Dalai Lama and said, oh, he seems like a very nice man. Well, that's true, but that's all he got. <laughs> oh, and other ones could meet Ramakrishna and so forth, and say, oh, yeah, very nice man. You know, okay, that's all they get, you know. But the higher ones can recognize, well, this is not unscientific. The great scientists recognize great scientists. And they know those who are not so accomplished. But the closest parallel is in mathematics. Mathematics is an objective science. There's no objective validation for mathematics. Einstein came up with his theories before there was any evidence. Special relativity, general relativity, no evidence. It came out of his own creativity, out of his own samadhi, his own intuition. Special relativity, general relativity. He was asked when he got a job at the University of Berlin, oh, now he's very famous. And he said, Professor Einstein, what kind of a laboratory, what kind of assistance, what kind of help do you need for pursuing your science here? He said, I need a, a pad of paper and a big waste paper basket. For all of his theories, it didn't work out. He just needed to be in a room with his mind and everything came out of his mind. Now he had samadhi. And he was very ethical too. 
to a large extent, very ethical man, not perfect man, not a, not a, not a saint, but an ethical man, good heart. And so mathematics, mathematics is a whole domain, which is the foundation of all of modern science. So you can't say it's not scientific, but mathematics is not objective. There are no technology, no external research you can do to prove a theorem. If it's pure mathematics, like number theory and so forth. And so mathematicians like Roger Penrose nowadays, or so Andrew Wiles, who proved Fermat's last theorem, it's pure number theory. It's, it was thought to be unprovable for 250 years. Fermat's last theorem, it's very famous. Nobody could prove it. Andrew Wiles, when he was a child, said, I want to prove it. So he devoted his whole life to proving this very simple theorem. And they came out with a proof 100 page long. And he presented it to his fellow very high level mathematicians. And he said, I proved Fermat's last theorem. And others of his level, they investigated his proof and he said, no, no, here's a fault. Here is a fault in your reasoning. And they all looked and said, yep, that's a fault in your reasoning. He said, oh, you're right. That's a fault in my reasoning. So he went back. You discovered fault. No objective evidence. It's pure mathematics. You and I look at it. We just see huh, designs on paper. But they all knew because they had the knowledge to be able to evaluate. He went back. back and then he came back and said, now I've done it. Now I've proved. First time, no, no. But now, yes, I proved. From a, and then he presented it. And they all looked. Whoa, congratulations, they all agreed. No evidence, no objective evidence, but they're all professionals and intersubjectively. They all recognized when it was defective and they all recognized when it was authentic. And then he got big awards. He became Sir Andrew, Sir Andrew and one award, another award, but it was all inside. But now does mathematics have practical application in modern science and technology? Massive. But mathematics doesn't come from outside, it comes from inside. And so I am absolutely persuaded that if scientists and artists and educators and politicians, if they develop samadhi, develop that inner quiet, that calm, that clarity, that sharpness of intelligence, that will make it deeper politics, deeper education, more benevolent art and technology and so forth, because it's coming from a place of profound sanity. Because we have mad scientists and mad politicians. We know that very clear. Insane politicians or mentally impaired politicians and people in education and so forth and so on. And so the, the, the spiritual is not just interior. If the yogi spends his whole life in, in retreat, okay, he'll come back next lifetime and then be much more, much more public figure in the next lifetime. But many of the yogis that I've trained with, and it's many, many over 50 years, they'll spend 10 years, 15 years in solitary meditation. And then they come out. And when they come out, they can offer wisdom and presence and compassion like never before. And they can bring wisdom to education, to science, to politics, to business, so that all of these fields of human endeavor, they all serve humanity and not just their own business, their own country, their own family, or making themselves more wealthy. So for all of these professions, if you go deep, it will, like sowing seeds of a flower, it will bloom and everybody will see the blossoms. As we see from the great saints, Sri Aurobindo and so many others, when they did blossom, then everybody gets the benefit. But if they don't cultivate inside, they may become very powerful, very wealthy, very famous, but they will bring their kleshas with them. And if you don't bring virtue, you will bring your kleshas. You'll bring your ego, you'll bring your anger, you'll bring your greed, your self-centeredness, your toxic nationalism. And then you're having a big impact. But like virtually all revolutions throughout history, there's a revolution that needed to be, but then the revolutionaries brought their mental afflictions and their delusion and their ego and their hatred. And so then you have to have another religion, another revolution after that, and another revolution after that. That's why in Buddhism and the yogic tradition, the first revolution has to start from inside. Profound revolution inside, away from klesha, away from avarana, obscurations, towards compassion and wisdom. And then whatever transformation you bring to the world, it will have no downside, only good. So every profession needs dharma. And dharma needs the revitalization of rigorous, critical inquiry and intersubjective corroboration. And that's why we want collaboration between scientists because they can have measures of empathy, of attention, of mindfulness, of ethics, 
they can study that objectively, and that's good. Then they learn from the yogis, and the yogis learn from scientists. Because how many yogis in Indian history, Tibet, American, how many people think, I'm a spiritual being, I have deep realization, I have very high realization, and then they have sexual misconduct. Or, as they say in India, men and gold. They think, I'm, I'm great yogi, I'm great, great. And then you say, oh yeah, you're exploiting these women. Oh, you're going for money. Oh yeah. So didn't they need some science to say, okay, maybe you have some realization, but have you checked your mental addictions? Are you bringing your mental addictions into the ashram? Mm -hmm. Are you bringing it into the monastery? Are you bringing it to the world? And very often, of course, I have my own mental addictions. I have to be very careful. But people who think they're yogis, they can also bring their mental afflictions. And so we need science. So the yogis themselves, we should have, just like scientists have conferences, scientists, that they mutually check each other and have peer review. How about yogis having peer review? <laughs> Some yogi says, look, I have this city, I have this city. Okay, very well, you have technology. But do you have compassion? Do you have ethics? You have real wisdom. So you have city, big deal. City is like having technology. It's just, it's just technology. But it can be used like anything else, can be used for good and bad. Cities can be used for, for good and bad. We know there's black magic or black dark. So the yogis need to have peer review. And they need to be reviewed by their students. The students should be looking on the guru to see that the guru is living in accordance with the dharma that he or she is teaching. So we all need to be looking after each other, not to be judgmental. But we, the, the students need to be attentive to the yogi, the guru, to make sure the guru is not screwing up. Because I'm guru to some people. I can screw yeah. up too. So my students have to watch me. I have to watch me. So, but this is science. This is critical. It's not judgmental, but it's intelligent. And then we can keep dharma really living up to dharma and not falling under egos and so forth. So dharma needs science. Science needs dharma. Contemplatives need science because we can fool ourselves into thinking we have realization we don't have. So then we have to have intersubjective validation. So I don't see, I, I see science and spirituality coming together, coming together like that. Mm -hmm. And in the Buddhist, you put your th two thumbs together, the union of upaya and prajna, and it's total union of method and wisdom of science and spirituality. And I think that's our hope. Yes, thank you very much. Again, we have uh, Ramuji who's uh, giving you this compliment. He's saying, Sagare, Sagare, Sama, Wallace can only be Wallace. So you compare only, there is no uh, similarity. You can't find another similar thing. So you can only compare the ocean with the ocean and similarly. <laughs> That's a very then I'm disciple of my guru because Dala Lama means Lama of the ocean, ocean like Lama. So I'm simply his jail. I just I try to follow in his footsteps. Yes. So. Uh, like I was telling you that there is a lot of requests to know how people can learn more about your work. Uh, we have Nicolas Mathias, you think, how, what can we do to support the Center for Contemplative Research in Colorado and to help other centers open globally? Similarly, there are people who are wanting to reach out to you and know how they can uh, implement some of this in their own lives and uh, become not just uh, practitioners themselves, but also maybe to join this club of uh, yogi peer reviewers. Wow. <laughs> Wonderful. Once they have a, once there is a certain progress, I would guess. So uh, if you could kindly share some contact details or contact details or just websites where people can reach out to you to know about your work. The Santa Barbara Institute for Consciousness Studies, I founded 17 years ago. So sbinstitute.com or Santa Barbara Institute for Consciousness Study. Very easy to find. There's also info at sbinstitute.com. So if you want to send a message, that can get to me. And then now as an affiliate, so no hierarchy, but an affiliate, we've just created the Center for Contemplative Research in Colorado. So the website is centerforcontemplativeresearch.org. Very easy. Mm -hmm. And we have right now only 11 cabins. And I have maybe 30 people applying to come for a long-term retreat. So I have many, many ORP applicants because I've been teaching a long time. We have many more people coming and we only have 11 cabins. So I'm hoping in the spring, when we get through the winter, because it's quite cold there, if we have funding, then I want to have maybe 30 cabins total. And that's just one center. But then another center in Italy and another, I want, I tried to create one in India. 
The first place I tried was India. We were having great a one. discussion on that. We didn't yeah, and the, the, it never blossomed. There wasn't enough support. I said, okay, if they don't want it, then I don't force. So then we tried Italy. Slowly that will come. But then this property in Colorado opened. So if people would like to donate, all the money goes, all of the money. My salary is 2000 a month. That's my salary. So, and I want nothing more. And if I don't get it, it, it that, that's okay because I have security. So I don't need money. I'm fine. So the donation would all go to making more cabins so we can have more yogis, more yogis, and then more centers. I had loved to see one in India. I tried. One in Italy, we're still trying. Other countries, what I've envisioned for years now is an association of research for contemplative science, ARCs, ARCs. And that is like, if the world is flooding, then we need ARCs to keep people up, to uphold karma. So what I've envisioned for a long time is we have Hindu Center for Contemplative Research and Christian and Muslim and Taoist and so forth. And then like the Human Genome Project, no hierarchy, nobody's above. I don't want to be above anybody, but we all have network. And then exactly in response to your question, then when Hindu yogis are making discoveries, then they check with the Buddhist. Did you discover this also? In Buddhist, Theravada, Mahayana, we're making discoveries. And can you corroborate? So like the scientists have done a marvelous job of networking. They network Human Genome Project and so many others. How many scientists now are looking for the vaccine for the, for the coronavirus? And so scientists are very good at networking with all of their peer reviewed journals and associations and conferences and meetings. So they are doing this intersubjective peer review and very intelligent, terrific success. Where are the yogis doing that? Not just to have interfaith dialogue. We, we talk a lot about our dharmas. Where are the yogis coming together? Not to make one tradition any more than there's one science. There's biology, there's chemistry, there's quantum mechanics, and there's material science and so forth but having a whole network of Buddhist, Hindu, and so forth, contented research centers, working with scientists whenever it seems useful. So we share with the scientists, we learn with the scientists. So we're starting in one place, and I'm starting with the tradition I know best, because that's just sensible. So we're starting with Buddhism, and we're starting with this beautiful land that for 38 years was a Carmelite Christian hermitage. And they didn't want it anymore. They were old, and they, and they, weren't, they were doing okay financially, but they were so happy to, to, to sell it to us for a very reasonable price. And they all, when, on the day we purchased, they all celebrated. They're so happy. Good, we're old, we want to retire. Thank you for taking this over. And I told these very dear Christian people, we are coming here to build on what you've created, not build over. Mm. So we're not going to cover over what you did. We're going to embrace that, celebrate that. They will continue holding mass Lovely. for the next year on our center. Lovely. I said, absolutely, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. And so any funds that can go, we, it would be wonderful to have more laboratories, more retreat, mat, retreat cabins. And I am not the only teacher. I have other, already three other teachers and more coming I want to invite from Asia and from the West. So it will be like a science department. You don't have one professor who teaches everything. That's crazy. Even in a physics department, not one professor. That's not a department. That's just one person. Mm -hmm. So not one teacher. I'm teach I, somebody had to start. So nobody else starting, so I must start. <laughs> but I'll be just one teacher. And I'll be also a student. I'll be meditating. When I'm there, I'll be meditating probably 12 hours a day. Normally only eight, seven, eight hours. But when I'm there, then I have only to be yogi and help others. And so it's kind of like running a doctoral program in contemplative research. But we'll invite our, our respected guests, because I do respect science. And the scientists I engage with, I respect all of them. They have ethics, they have morality, they are open-minded. So I deeply respect. And I don't respect closed-mindedness and dogmatism, but there are closed-minded dogma dogmatic Buddhists, of course, and Hindus and Christians and atheists. So we're not here to promote any one religion, but we are here to promote open-mindedness. And I would say I am an evangelist for samyaksuka, <laughs> for genuine well-being, because it's not just in religion. It's also in philosophy, and it's also in science, and it unifies and does not separate. So I am promoting the salvation of humanity is stop focusing single-pointedly on mundane pleasure, power, prestige, wealth, and focus above all on genuine well-being. And for that, we need science and spirituality. So sbinstitute.com, Center for Contemplative Research. If funds come up, we'll have more cabins and then more centers. That's yeah. our ideal. That's the meaning of my life. <laughs> Thank you, Alice, for this passionate uh, 
presentation and also like giving something very concrete in front of us as to how we can go forward especially with this contemplative observatories and also thank you for that invitation because uh, indica yoga as a platform it 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 is an inclusive and it's uh, diverse in its approach and it focuses right. on yoga right. yoga programs which is authentic immersive and transformative so as long as these three conditions are fulfilling uh, being which tradition might be and which can offer us an immersive experience and which will finally lead towards a transformation so this is how we have described ourselves and we would be very happy to see how we can uh, work with you Uh, especially on these projects and we'll definitely be happy we're looking forward to do that in fact the hope uh, for the future is collaboration we think we all work together in sure. fact on uh, 31st morning we were wanting to have a discussion i mean online with our friends participants and some uh, senior practitioners on uh, trying to see what kind of a program of yoga charya can be developed that would promote teachers with the spirit uh of being contemplative researchers not just as yoga charya who know asana and who know this and who can impart that information but who are also practitioners and from with a scientific temperament so that's something that we are wanting to do and we would love it if you have the time we'll discuss it to see if you can join us on that but we'll discuss it but uh, i would also like to uh, mention that here where i teach now it's this uh, iit it's an indian technology the technology institute it's one of the premium technology institutes we uh, started a center uh, called the reiki center of excellence for the science of happiness and where we are trying to look at how we can integrate technology and um, this uh, mindful pra mindfulness practices mantra traditions all of this so we have with us the executive director the former executive director of the gross national happiness center from bhutan uh, dr oh, yeah. chetri he's here wonderful with so we'd yeah. love to also see in which way in what ways we can collaborate with you for this fantastic program. i was invited to teach there this fall but then because of the pandemic i had to cancel otherwise i would be in bhutan in in december okay. or november yeah okay. there's a wonderful work there again rooted in the wisdom of india because yeah. bhutan is buddhist and it come from india Yeah. So wonderful work, wonderful work. Yeah. So this is again for us very heartening because sometimes some teachers try to present uh, Buddhism and Hinduism as if you know. First of all, it's not Hinduism. Neither of them are isms, but they try and present these two darshanas, these two ways of looking at life, uh, as you know, uh, opposing to each other. Yes, these yeah. are complementary systems. They've grown. I mean, they've literally almost grown from each other, sort of. and bodily uh, practices either way so i don't think there is a requirement to try and have this upmanship a one upmanship thing so wonderful uh, yeah like i always say i have this hard task of saying that now we will have to put a pause button <laughs> we never put a stop button with any of our wonderful speakers so i will have to put a pause button but before that i just like to make the announcements for tomorrow's program and then i'll come back to you and request you for a message we've had a request in the question and answers box somebody was also wanting to maybe just hear from you in very in brief if you'd like to share about what the chanting om mani padme hum means because it's very significant for the buddhist practitioners so if you'd like to maybe just share a few words on that and then share your message uh, we would be very grateful So I come back to uh, I request Koti Ram Prasad ji to kindly share the evening post. I mean tomorrow's post, not the evening post. Tomorrow's post. Sir. So tomorrow we have with us two uh, very eminent speakers. Uh, the first one is Dr. Sujata Ameya, and she's a relationship and self actualization coach, a psychotherapist, and founder of Inner Horizons. So she'll be talking to us on relationship, a mirror, and a path to the self uh, so please make yourselves available because in today's pandemic situation also uh, we are seeing a lot of rise in uh, frictions within families so i think this kind of a session will be very helpful because we don't know how long the situation is going to last so please attend it and also encourage other friends and uh, relatives to also listen to these presentations the evening one is again another very thought provoking and insightful talk by uh, dr jacques vin 
He's a doctor, psychiatrist, author, spiritual guide, and meditation teacher. A French uh, doctor. He has settled in India. He travels between Europe and India. And he's going to be talking to us on use of meditation and yoga with psychiatric or psychopathological patients. So he's a prolific writer as well and brings in just what you were mentioning, the scientific understanding in the domain of mental health, especially, and combined with spirituality. So with these few uh, words about tomorrow's program, I would like to request, go back to you now, Alan, and I request you to please share a few words, uh, a few more drops of wisdom and uh, charge, charging us up for the, <laughs> for the future that is ahead of India. <laughs> I immediately go back to my first encounter, my first audience with this Holiness Dalai Lama when I was 21 years old. And I'd been in India only a few months. I studied for one year in Germany, but knew very little. And so I was an utter beginner. I was like a baby. And I, every day I was receiving teachings on Buddha Dharma. But after just a few months, and I was getting learning Tibetan quite quickly, I had nothing else to do except for study Tibetan language and study Dharma. But I found after just a few months that I saw a point of concern. And that is I knew I'm just a com complete beginner. But when other Westerners would come to Dharmzala, then I would feel, oh, I know more than you do. Uh -huh. I, I'm, I know better Tibetan than you. I, I, know more med more, I know more meditation than you. I, do, I know better. And I would, oh, I'm already feeling superior. I've been here only two or three months, and I'm now feeling superior. But I want to continue practicing Dharma, which means cultivating virtue, becoming a better person, subduing mental afflictions. So how do I become a better person and not feel I'm better? And I want to become a better person, as much as I can, virtuous person, happy person, mental afflictions down, more ethical. But then how do you avoid feeling superior? And I had been told, because I was living in the home of the Dalai Lama's personal physician, he took me in. I said, and he said, you can meet the Dalai Lama. He said, I don't, want to, I don't want to meet him until I have something important to ask. Now I have something important to ask. How do you become a better person and not feel superior? So I had my audience with His Holiness, one-on-one. -on -one. And they said, Your Holiness, if I continue to learn more and more, have more knowledge and so forth, and then I'm feeling more and more superior, then, then it's suicidal, it's, it's catastrophe. So how do we avoid this? How do we avoid pride? And he said, oh, imagine that you are a beggar. You have no money. And you come to some house where you smell very good food. And you come to the door. Bakshish, bakshish, can you get food? Just a little bit of food. Some scraps. Bakshish. And the master of the house comes and he greets you and says, no, come on in. We're having dinner right now. Come and join us. And they're having a banquet. And they sit you down like member of family. <laughs> you eat all you want. And you have seconds. You have thirds until you can't eat anymore. When you've had all the food treated like family, eating the banquet, when you've had your meal, do you feel proud? I said, no. What do you feel? Gratitude. And then he turned to me and said, Alan, you came here to India. You came here to us Tibetans. You were a beggar. I had almost no money. I didn't even have enough money for the return ticket. Only one way. You came here as a beggar. Emotion comes. It's a motion of gratitude. We've offered you everything. And you're getting benefit. You're eating. You're eating dharma. So why would you feel proud? We've given you everything for free. Of course. And you're accepting and you're eating. So there's no reason for pride. Just gratitude. You're right. And then he added, Alan, the more understanding you have, the more intelligence you have, the greater responsibility you have. He said, like, take one fly that comes to a drop of honey and is taking the honey all by itself. And another fly comes and the first fly goes, and scares away, violence, aggression. No, my, my honey, my honey. 
Well, we don't blame the fly. It's just a fly. It's behaving out of, out of habit, instinct, yes? So we don't blame. But then he said, I am Tenzin Gyatso. That's his personal name. If I should behave like that, selfish, then that's shameful. Because I have much more intelligence than a fly. And I understand Dharma. So the more intelligence we have, the more knowledge we have, the more understanding we have, the greater responsibility we have. So the only response as you grow in wisdom, in ability, in accomplishment, is just gratitude all the way through, because without others, we would have nothing to offer. And the greater knowledge and experience, expertise we have, the greater responsibility we have to serve the world to the best of our ability. And that's what you're doing. That's what I'm doing. And if we all that, we can make a heaven for everyone. It's not complicated. Not complicated. We can make this world a heaven for all of us together with all of the animal and other beings that we, with whom we share this planet. So thank you for this opportunity. We are deeply indebted to you for this very beautiful message. Um, Last, if I may, would you just like to lead us with a chant to close? Would you be inspired to do that? Oh, mani me hum. Oh, mani pe me hum. Oh, mani pe me hum. Oh, mani pe. In a very short, in the Buddhist understanding, Om, Ah, Om, refers to or symbolizes body, speech, and mind. Mani and Pema, or Padma, Padme. Mani and Padma refers to the wisdom and the action united. And Hum refers to the deepest wisdom the most profound wisdom, the culmination of all our dreams and aspirations. And so it is the mantra of compassion, the verbal expression of compassion. Om Mani Padme Hum. And I receive that transmission from His Holiness Dalai Lama. Thank you, Master. We are blessed that you shared it with us today and for so many other gifts that you've given us. Extremely grateful. It's my privilege. Thank you.